Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll call this meeting to order. And uh, we'll go back to our clerk for now and acknowledgement, please. Thank you, Worship. We begin our meeting by recognizing the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada as traditional stewards and caretakers of the land. We acknowledge that the town of Wasaga Beach is located within the boundaries of Treaty 18. The traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Tionantati, Wendat, and is home of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples as part of an intricate nationhood that reaches across Turtle Island. At this time of truth and reconciliation, we welcome the opportunity to work together towards new understandings and new relationships and ask for guidance in all we do. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on to item number two on the agenda, disclosure of pecuniary interests. Do I have any pecuniary interests at this time? Seeing none, if at one point throughout the uh, presentation you do have a, or feel you have a pecuniary interest, please let us know at that time. Moving on to item number three, deputations, presentations, petitions, and public meetings. We do have uh, one pr presentation today uh, by our lovely treasurer with respect to the 2023 budget discussion draft one. So, uh, Jocelyn, we'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Your Worship, and good afternoon, members of council, staff, and visitors. Um, at this time, I'll uh, turn the, the presentation over to our CAO for opening remarks. And we'll Thank just you. finish bringing up the slide deck here first. Thank you, Jocelyn, and through Mayor to, and to members of Council. We're, we're pleased to be, for you, be before you today to present the first draft of the budget. I'm going to provide just a few high-level opening remarks and then turn it over to Jocelyn and the team to walk you through some of the details. So if we could just get the, the next slide, please. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Laura? Can you? It's not. There, that worked. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much. So, much like every municipality uh, across the province, uh, most are going through budgets right now. Um, it's never an easy time, and uh, you, you have our, our assurance that staff are doing everything we can to sharpen our pencils and ensure that we're coming forward with uh, a prudent plan, a prudent budget that's sustainable um, and that minimizes the tax increase to, to residents and business owners within the community of Osaga Beach. Um, in the macroeconomic climate today, uh, it's quite challenging and you will hear that this is impacting virtually every municipality. Um, municipalities are struggling with issues around inflation, supply chain, rising interest rates, et cetera. And this is having a dramatic impact on our budget. So that, that is one of the reasons why you're seeing a higher rate before you today. The province, uh, the legislation that has been coming out of Queen's Park over the past few years um, has been exceedingly high. Um, I've never seen anything like it in my career. All of the bills that are coming forward are impacting municipalities, um, not only in the 2023 budget, but it will continue to impact for coming years. Bill 23 is one that, uh, of significant note. Wasaga Beach is, is luckier than some of the larger municipalities in the GTA. Uh, Bill 23 is not hitting Wasaga Beach as hard as some of the bigger centers, but it is still uh, impacting Wasaga Beach. Um, and then some of the uh, investments that were made by the last term of council, that is impacting this budget. Um, capital projects such as the arena library, um, that is a significant driver of, of increase in this budget. Um, staffing up uh, for opening day to ensure that we have people that um, are there to service the community and make sure that we're operating that facility at a, at a high quality. We have to plan for that in this budget and start to uh, be planning for, for rolling staff in. So on, on opening day, we're, we're operating a high level of quality. So those are just some of the pressures that are impacting why, why this number is a little bit higher for residents of Wasaga Beach. Um, Jocelyn, her team, and, and the broader team within, within Town Hall uh, have worked hard to ensure that we are looking at this through the lens of sustainability. 
not only short term but long term for Wasaga Beach. Um, we can't fall into the trap of just planning and budgeting for four years. Uh, we need to be thinking decades out, uh, replacing infrastructure over numerous years and planning for that because uh, a lot of municipalities have hit a wall once the rapid growth that Wasaga Beach is currently experiencing, it does come to an end uh, and you become uh, into a period of intensification, urbanization. While you are in that rapid growth phase, um, it is very smart to be planning for when it changes. Um, so that there's an element of that within this budget so that we're protecting the best interests of the corporation for decades and future generations as well. Uh, we're also looking at the, the asset management requirements uh, and Jocelyn can talk into detail ab about what this means. Uh, but the rules have changed around this. We need to be planning for this. Um, I mentioned earlier, minimizing the impact to residential property owners. Um, we understand full well. We hear the comments that, that are, are out in the community. Uh, we're doing everything we can to try and keep this increase low. One of the challenges that Wasaga Beach faces is an exceptionally high residential tax base. Uh, it's in the low 90%. That is abnormally high for communities across the province. And uh, one of the things we'll be working hard at over the next four years and beyond is to try and improve that situation and try and diversify the tax base of this community to prevent the, these types of increases in the future. But we need to recognize today, unfortunately, that is the tax base that we have, and that's how we, we need to fund things. Um, we are trying to shift the way that we're looking at the budget for Wasaga Beach. We're trying to have a more strategic approach to budgeting. And uh, council, we've been meeting over the last few days, uh, understanding term of council priorities. I think I, I'll be meeting with uh, Councillor DeLeo tomorrow. Um, that's going to be very important uh, as we think about moving into the next next round of budget talks and layering on uh, what all of you would like to see happen uh, in this community over the next while. Um, so there will be a strategic lens layering over council, term of council priorities. Um, additionally, one of the conventional traps that a lot of communities fall into, particularly smaller ones, is just looking at things project by project building a casino, building a library, building an arena. We'd like to hopefully um, be a little more strategic in how we think about spending tax dollars. Um, if we're spending $1 on a capital investment, how do we realize three or four in return? And how do we catalyze other things? So um, focusing on catalytic opportunities and partnerships. Um, the province is an incredible partner, has been an incredible partner for this community over many, many decades. Those relationships were, um, I don't wanna say severed, but they were not worked to their full potential over the, the, the past few years. We're looking at reconnecting, re-engaging with our provincial partners, because um, that's how you leverage funding from other levels of government and not just the province, but the federal government as well. So catalyzing uh, opportunities, focusing on key strategic priorities, leveraging partnership opportunities. Those are some of the big things that we're going to be looking at doing and ultimately diversifying the tax base. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Jocelyn. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to advance this slide here. So I'm going to start with where we are in the budget process and I'm going to take you through a few slides, a high level overview of where we are. Some of it is just a recap of what we have done previously in December, but it's a good um, item to have here for discussion today. So on December 15th, that's when we um, pr uh, put forward draft one, and at that time, um, the blended tax rate change is 6%, and our municipal tax rate change is an increase of 8.8%. And so that brings us here today to where we're gonna do a detailed review of draft one, um, we'll have the opportunity to look at the operating and capital budgets and have the departments um, present their budgets and highlights for 23 and gives council members an opportunity to ask questions and staff a chance to uh, receive committee's comments and directions for, dra for draft two. Mm -hmm. 
So when we're reviewing budgets, we make adjustments necessary that maintain our existing service levels. And these adjustments are usually minor. However, if demand has increased a lot, where we're growing a lot, it may be necessary to increase some of our resources significantly to help just keep that service level the same. There are some carryover items that also come into the budget that come forward from 2022. And as we move through the department budgets, they will uh, highlight some of those carryovers for you. There are also new initiatives or replacements that are incorporated in the budget. And we have fleet purchases and new capital projects. And during the individual department pre presentations, again, they'll go through the details of their capital programs. We have opportunities for efficiency improvements that we consider in the budget process. And an example where efficiencies are gained is through updated software tools. And so this year we have a new asset management software tool that is being rolled out. Um, th and this should provide better information for staff and assist us with some of the overall asset management um, requirements that we have in general and will help us meet the new legislation um, that requires us to make certain reporting and planning financial planning for the assets. We also look at new enhancements, and these could be new service levels. And we have a number of those requests in this budget. We have uh, new staffing requests. Some of these are driven by new legislation, and some of these are just driven because ex service levels are expanding. So we also will have some pending items for draft two. Not everything makes it into draft one, and also draft one is the very early stages of the budget, so there's still some estimations that we get better information for as we move forward. And um, some of the following items are pending for draft two. We know we'll still have a few uh, staffing amendments. We'll have final leases for finalizing the rental income for the beachfront. There will be adjustments to the capital project. Some of the capital costs will um, change. And we have additional items identified sometimes during draft two. There can be a new initiative that wasn't known at the time of building draft one. There's going to be some inflationary adjustments that are based on the expense analysis that we do at the end of the year, where we're, that's where we're really going to determine what's our inflationary pressure on some of our run costs. and. Um, is the budget number that was there sufficient to accommodate that, or do we have to even increase, increase it further? We also have the, um, for draft two, the corporate priorities. So council is still in their process, working through their council priorities. And as we um, move forward, we'll have that information and be able to um, place those, allo those specific allocations from the placeholder funding that we have in draft one. We'll be able to allocate that out more correctly to the appropriate budget once we know. And lastly, we'll look at our reserve adjustments for tax rate stabilization and any um, opportunities that we might consider with moving that forward. Um, the, the town financially is very stable. We're in a good position for moving forward with our new initiatives. The reserves are healthy. And, and so are the deferred revenues, and those are our development charges. The debt is relatively low. Um, at the end of 2022, it's about 19.2 million, with a carrying cost of 1.9 million. And as a result of the strong financial position, the town can afford to incur some additional debt to complete capital projects, such as our new arena library. And as a benchmark that demonstrates the town's financial strategies and our abilities and that we're doing things well, is that our proposed tax rate continues to be lower than most of our municipal comparators. So this strong financial position helps us to leverage our financial strength with other partners. And that's what Andrew was speaking to in our opening slide. And using the low debt level, it helps us to provide the capital fa financing that we need. It allows us also, we, in par as part of our financial strategy, we look to make sure we're contributing back to our reserves um, and have those available for future planning. We also, um, as mentioned earlier, we look for that tax rate 
smoothing as best as we can year over year um, so that we can still reach sustainability and achieve the objectives that we're trying to, to achieve. So we try to um, have those increases and, and smooth them out as best as we can. So now looking at the budget numbers, the two pie charts show how much of the budget is for operating versus how much is for capital. And it also shows how much the budgets have changed in 2023 when compared to 22. So in 23, the total budget is 114 million. As compared to 22, the budget was 102 million. Some projects are carried over from one year to the next, so they could be included in the capital number for both years. Um, the, the Arena Library project is an example of that. It, it carries over, we budget a certain amount for that project, and it's a multi-year project. The operating and capital budgets maintain similar ratios to that of 22, so you can see in 23 our operating is 43% and our, our capital budget is 57%, and that's very similar to what it was in, in 22. This chart shows how operating expenses are distributed through the various programs and services. And the largest cost is for public works, and that's 37%. And on the right, you can see a little chart I've added there. 37% is about 18 million. Next, there is a police, the policing cost, and that's um, not in our control. Uh, that has increased by 11%, and so has the, gover the general government section. Um, the cost for those portions is 5.4 million, and the little boxes, I call out boxes to the side, tell you what's included in some of those rolled up numbers there. At the 9% share, there is community services, corporate services, and fire services. And the 9% share is about 4.4 million. And the planning and development is 6% or 2.9 million. And the remaining smaller shares make up the difference. So the total operating budget for all of these programs and services is 48.8 million. The next few slides were shown during the December 15th presentation, but I've brought them forward again just, just for a little bit of a recap. So the operating budget increased by 3.8 million, and this chart lists the major drivers of that change. So coal and step and wage adjustments are 875,000, and there are new staffing costs of 963,000. Policing costs are 164,000, and our construction financing for the Arena Library project increased some of our financing costs, and that's 316,000. We have large insurance costs, that, and, and in this budget, it's reflecting the change of both 22 and 23, and that's 237,000. And as the 23 budget is the first budget of this term of council, we have that placeholder amount of 550,000, which will be allocated to the appropriate budgets once um, the priority setting project is completed. And um, the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund is, uh, this is the tax impact. So this um, fund, as it's being reduced each year, it's a grant from the province to help fund operating costs of the municipality. So as it's reduced each year, a little bit more of our operating costs has to be picked up through taxation. And so that impact is 49,000. And then we have the Wasega Stars Arena study for the old building at 75,000. Um, we contribute to our election reserve now that it's not an election year. We have 68,000, and then the uh, remaining items I've just grouped together there is 500,000. So that gives you a general sense of some of the um, costs that are being driven through the operating change. And under the capital program, the total program is 65.6 million, and it's supported through taxation with $3.3 million of taxation. And so the first four numbers in the group on the left slide, this is just showing that three point, or the, sorry, the 65.6 million broken down by our different um, committee groups. So we have general government, community services, public works and development. 
and so you can see how the capital program is being spent in those areas. And then below that line, I give some summary there of some of the capital uh, areas. So roads and bridges are 5.3. Uh, we have a new building in public works at 5.8. Our water sewer program is 14.4. Storm drainage, 1.1. And then parks and fleet, another couple of million. And then we have the new arena, the new library, and the furniture and fixtures associated with the, that project. We also have a new elevator plan for the town hall. And lastly, we have some reserve contributions. And I'll just mention under the reserve contributions that we currently have 5.1 million in there. That's because at the time of producing draft one, we were still doing the previous development master plan for the, de um, for the beachfront. And at that time, there would have been a, a payment planned for um, the f a portion of the sale of the lands. So that's in draft one, but that's going to be removed out when we get to draft two. And so that explains some of the capital program costs. We've seen this slide before, which demonstrates where the town's tax rate is relative some to its municipal comparators. You can see Wasega Beach is in, on the lower side of the, the chart. And we're comparing right now our 23 tax rate with the other municipalities 22 tax rates. So that position will even improve more when we update this chart when the other municipalities have set their 23 tax rates. And the impact of this, uh, of our tax rate change on an average household for Wasaga Beach, which is 333,000 is a typical average household amount that MPAC provides us with. The cost will be for the municipal portion $174. And on this chart, there is a $350,000 assessment value and a 450, just for comparative purposes. And if we look at this chart, similar information, you can see there on the municipal tax that the change in the municipal tax is $174. And then you can see the county tax will increase by $32. There'll be no increase in the education tax. And this brings the total um, increase annually for taxes on an average household of 333000 to $207 a year. It also shows you at the bottom of this chart the blended tax rate increase of 6% so that if you're looking at one tax bill to the next tax bill, you would expect to see uh, an approximate 6% increase. So looking now, what we're projecting for um, the end of the year on our debt projection. We expect um, the end of 22 to be at 19.1 million. And um, at the end of 23, that will move up to or, towards uh, 43.7 million. And that's when we start to have the financing really kicking in for the new arena library. And uh, the carrying cost at 22, at the end of 2023, for this de debt level of the 43.7, it's estimated at 2.3 million. And we're currently only using 26.7% of the debt capacity that the province authorizes the town to carry. So our annual repayment limit, and this is our 22 number, our 23 number hasn't been received yet, but our 22 number is 8.6 million. If we project out that we're going to be running around 2.3, that's the 26.7%. So we're still well within our capacity of carrying this level of debt. Um, when I look at this slide, I'm talking about the reserves, wanting to just give you a little bit of uh, information about what we expect at the end of 23. We expect that the regular general reserves, they will be going down by about 14.2 million. You can see there's a large draw in the water sewer reserve there and 9.8 million in our general reserves. Um, and the, uh, we also contribute to those reserves. You can see we have some monies coming in from um, general reserve contributions and our reserve fund contributions. So then over under deferred revenues, and these are our development charges, you can see there that we will be drawing on our development charges, but we also will be collecting new charges in the year. 
and we have the, our contributions there. So we have a net change of 12.5 million. In, so that's what we're expecting as general activity for 2023. So at that, that concludes just the quick overview summary and we're at this point ready to move into the departmental slides. Is there any questions before I move forward? Thank you, Justin. Questions or comments from Council? Councilor Belanger? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just to our uh, Director of Building Services, uh, earlier you talked about a very early trend, but obviously we're in a different development market today than we were four years ago. Uh, and I'm sure you've worked with the Treasurer, but is that a, a very conservative projection on development charges or uh, what is our contingencies if uh, development charges uh, come in under expectation? So like Jocelyn's going to answer that? Y yes, Your Worship, through you, if I may. Um, so that, that number has, was put together using a very low um, a year of development charges and a high year of de development charges and then averaging it. So it's an average of what we typically have. And, and recently, um, um, Danny and I were speaking about lowering this possibly in draft to a little bit more because of, for the 23 year. Looks like we might be a little bit below average in the 23 year. So we will in draft to lower that somewhat and we're gonna look at those numbers a little bit more closer together and then we can make that change. So I, I, I don't think it's like huge number change, but we will lower it a little bit. I can see it coming down into the mid to high 4 million range instead of the 5.4 that it is. Thank you, Justin. Councilor Blanger, go ahead. Yeah, so just uh, follow up on that. Have, uh, as you know, the county and every municipality are projecting the impact of Bill 23 on development charges. Has that uh, already been factored into this first forecast? So, through your worship, no, that has not been factored into draft one yet. We're still waiting for some information from back from our consultants that is gonna give us a better understanding of, of what that number realistically might be. So we'll have better information in draft two for that. But again, um, I think that will hit us in outer years more than it's gonna hit in 23. Thank you. All right, no other questions from council or comments? Please carry on. Thank you, Your Worship. So at this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to um, our Fire Chief, Craig Williams, to present the, his department presentation. Great. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Your Worship, members of Council. I'll uh, provide you with the budget overview for the Fire Department Emergency Management and Health and Safety. So our first slide is our operating budget, and this is just highlighting the notable increases uh, that you'll find within the proposal. Uh, it does include our regular COLA and STEP increases for the year. Our first item on the list is uh, the addition of a new permanent full-time position, which is a fire prevention officer. Uh, we're proposing a July start date, and the allocation of this budget line comes 80% from the fire department and 20% from the building department. As you're aware, municipalities are required under law to provide uh, fire inspections, uh, fire code enforcement, and education programs. I recently did a survey of Simcoe County Fire Departments and find that, found that with the exception of three small rural municipalities, Agilitas, Orontio, uh, Essa, and Romera, who do not have fire prevention officers, and also excluding Barry, who has nine fire prevention officers, all other municipalities have between one and three full-time permanent uh, resources allocated just to uh, prevention services. In Wasega Beach, we have zero. With the town growth and uh, increasing calls that we've uh, continued to occur year after year, we are beginning to have difficulty fulfilling uh, the legislative requirements of the fire department uh, that's provided to us by the fire marshal's office and as well under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act. 
the introduction of a fire prevention officer, although it will potentially uh, help us find some cost avoidance efficiencies, such as a large fire truck uh, spending less time responding to uh, these inspections, so less wear and tear on these vehicles. Really what we're looking forward to um, is the redistribution of work from the chief and the deputy fire chief. We spend a great deal of our time uh, focusing on prevention efforts, and quite frankly, uh, we could spend more of our time working on department strategy. Um, within your budget binders, you'll find a detailed staff justification report um, that I hope you have the time to review, and I appreciate your consideration of this position. Our next line item is for our dispatch contract with the City of Barrie. Um, in 2023, the cost will be $80,000. Uh, this cost is determined uh, on a per capita basis. It's calculated the same for all municipalities. And we've had several years of increases and our budget hasn't kept up with that. And that's why you see a larger jump this year. Uh, the increase in the medical supply line is a reflection of increased uh, supply costs that we've experienced. Uh, combined with the increased number of responses that uh, we've incurred. Under meals and accommodation, we're asking for an additional $4,600. In 2021, the Ontario Fire College closed. While it was open, um, registration costs covered accommodations and meals for firefighters. Now that it's not available, when we can't offer training to our firefighters in-house, they have to travel to regional training centres across the province, and unfortunately that's uh, created a new cost for us with hotels and uh, added meals. Um, like you'll see, I'm sure, in most departments, uh, we have inflationary cost increases under our insurance line. And then a new line item here is uh, to, the, to celebrate our 75th uh, anniversary for the Wasaga Beach Fire Department. Uh, so we're asking for a modest $2,000 in order to uh, hopefully be able to have an open house for the community, um, invite the community in, teach them about some of our history, and hopefully be able to recognize some of our members, uh, current and past, with different uh, mementos. Our second slide will address uh, capital and the draft changes for uh, the second um, version of the, the budget. Uh, so our first line is a refurbishment of uh, pumper number two of $61,000. So pumper number two is a frontline pumper. It's a 2014 that has 127,000 kilometers on it. It is halfway through its life expectancy. So we hope to see this uh, for 15 years in total. It has a, a number of mechanical uh, and cosmetic deficiencies. And I'm confident that without addressing these issues today, we are not going to get 15 years out of this truck. So hopefully this is a, a solution that can help us prolong the age of the truck. Our second line item is for uh, furniture and kitchen appliances. Uh, this is uh, for our renovation that is ongoing at station two. Uh, the appliances found in that station when we uh, started the renovation were between 20 and 25 years old. Uh, and due to the redesign of the station, uh, we've actually have a smaller kitchen area. So all the appliances are, um, uh, how would you call them? They're apartment sized. So we have a, a new dishwasher, a stove, microwave, uh, and so on. So with this uh, line, it's just to simply uh, get some new appliances and hopefully buy a kitchen table and a, and a few chairs. Um, the third item is for bunker gear. Um, we have a total of 13 sets of bunker gear that are expiring. Bunker gear is, uh, is expires after 10 years, and that's an uh, NFPA standard that we have to follow. The next line is uh, sort of similar, is for breathing apparatus bottles. So we have a total of 27 uh, bottles. These are carbon fiber, bo carbon fiber bottles that the firefighters wear on their backs that they get their fresh breathing air from. Uh, they have a 15 year shelf life um, that's covered under an NFPA standard as well. And these bottles are also expiring. Um, in addition to the draft two that we are requesting is $8,000 for the installation of the um, dispatch radio antenna wiring and speakers in station two. This was an oversight that wasn't included in our first version of the budget. Um, so with that said, that completes my slide and I'm happy to take any um, questions that you might have. Thank you, Chief. Questions or comments from Council? Seeing none, I just I have uh, just a couple. Uh, breathing apparatus bottles, 48.9 thousand. Are we replacing all 27 of those bottles, Chief? That's correct. So they will all then in 10 years uh, become due again? 15 years. Or 15 years, yeah. okay, thank you. So our, our department has about uh, 90 bottles all together, and okay. uh, we have them on a life cycle of 15 years each. Okay, good, thank you. And then the radio equipment installation, was there not radio equipment in that fire station before? 
that there was it was a very basic system um, so during the renovation it was determined by our radio supplier that the wiring and the antenna was outdated it was original to the 1970s installation that was put in there so it was advised to that it was time for replacement mm -hmm. as well the original station uh, didn't have speakers uh, throughout the station there was basically two locations that you were hopefully close enough to hear the radio go off so this is adequately covers the entire station thank you very much no other questions or comments from council carry on uh, madam treasurer Thank you, Your Worship. And um, I'll move now to the next department presentation. And uh, Kevin Lalonde, our Director of Public Works, will provide his presentation. Thank you, Your Worship. Usually I go at the end, so thanks for putting me <laughs> at the front. Um, okay, Public Works, uh, I, th I don't need to provide an overview. I think everyone is well aware of what we do. Uh, generally speaking, uh, our, our, our operations budget is, is relatively status quo. Um, we do have a number of staffing needs identified uh, simply to address uh, and maintain current service levels due to continued growth and infrastructure expansion, but as well as provincial downloading and um, changes in legislation and regulations, as I'll speak to. We have a number of um, staff specific for the Parks Department. Uh, we're looking to uh, replace an existing eight-month contract with a full-time laboring position with a, a certified arborist. We were without uh, that critical need in our department and we're looking to expand our capacity in the Parks Division through that uh, replacement of a position. The, the project engineer is, is something that's evolved uh, primarily due to uh, changes in legislation which now uh, requires municipalities to be the approval authority for environmental compliance approvals. Uh, previously, the Ministry of the Environment uh, would uh, undertake detailed reviews of stormwater and, and sanitary sewer design, including calculations, and would issue what we call the Environmental C Compliance Approval, or CFA, as, as previously referred to. This has been downloaded to municipalities among that and, and another of uh, a number of responsibilities, including uh, monitoring plans, cond condition assessments, and reporting structures. So there's, there's increased uh, administrative responsibilities in the engineering division. This particular position will also support the needs um, due to Bill 23 and our responsibilities to respond and uh, provide review comments in a much shortened period of time, which uh, we simply don't have the staff to meet some of those needs uh, to meet that new mandate. Um, otherwise, we will have to return uh, planning fees. There are a few studies, uh, and these are recurring studies in the department. The, the roads need study is a condition assessment that we perform every five years, and it looks at the structural adequacy, the drainage, uh, the ride comfort rating, and, and the surface condition of our roads. And we develop a long-term plan to look at how to best manage those uh, needs, whether it be reconstruction, rehabilitation, or just preventive maintenance. That's a plan that's due this year. We also have the continuation of the townwide master drainage plan, and there's carryover costs identified for that. Uh, that's our long-term plan to help establish uh, a structure around how to best address um, the drainage issues and challenges we have throughout the community and helping us prioritize the needs and, and establishing a, a sustainable capital plan around that. We also have the five-year review of our townwide water modeling update, and this provides kind of a long-term vision, 25-year strategy around um, our water infrastructure. And so that's uh, from expansion and replacement and, and simply to address the growth throughout the community and make sure that we're well prepared in advance of, of those demands, both from a planning perspective, a design perspective, and then making sure that the infrastructure is in place well in advance of its critical need. Under the capital plan, um, there's, there's several um, multi-year projects that are continuing into 2023, including the Ramblewood Drive urbanization project. We're hoping to, to finish that one off. That's between 45th and 58th Street. So we're looking to address the uh, surface asphalt uh, boulevard restoration and sidewalk improvements, and that'll finish that project up this summer. We have the West End Elevated Water Tower and Depot lands, um, primarily site preparation uh, site grading and the construction of Joan Avenue, and, and that is to prepare the site for the West End Elevated Water Tower, which is uh, which will follow in the next uh, two to five years. Um, and that elevated water tower is needed to address uh, not only commercial fire flow demands, but also long-term growth and, and storage demands. We will 
ideally complete the beach drive reconstruction design and address property matters. Uh, this is, although the design is well underway, uh, we do need to uh, finalize that detailed design before we're prepared for construction. And we're nearing the completion of the Mosley Street urbanization design, and, and that's just simply a carryover identified uh, for 67,000 to address that. And that'll be the curb and gutter, storm sewer and sidewalk, as well as bike lanes for uh, Mosley Street uh, when we do get to Mosley Street. So this is more of a proactive plan and, and making sure that these designs are, are uh, construction ready and, and available for future funding. Um, the one major construction program we are proposing this year is the River Road West uh, reconstruction and urbanization and I guess you could call it phase two and this is the stretch of River Road West between Veterans Way and Blueberry Trail. Uh, this will likely be a, a two and a half to three year program and, and it's uh, a, a critically important uh, transportation corridor for the community and, and our residents and businesses and uh, we look forward to uh, urbanizing that and getting sidewalks certainly along the front edge of Birchview Dunes. Uh, the final uh, is the, the day labor projects, which is primarily our resurfacing strategies and our resurfacing projects. We're looking to advance paved shoulders along 39th Street South and improve just the, uh, the pedestrian connectivity between Knox Road West and, and the school at Worsley. We also have a paved shoulder addition on 45th Street North between 45th and Shore Lane to address the, the seasonal um, increase in pedestrian traffic along there to get to the beach. And we're also looking to improve the, uh, the pedestrian uh, accessibility and, and safety along Mosley Street on the north side between 52nd and uh, about 60th Street. Under the water and wastewater projects, uh, again, a number of carryover projects, multi-year projects at the sewage treatment plant. Uh, including the biosolids complex upgrades. We have the detailed design uh, continuing for the inlet building and bar screen retrofit. We are looking to advance the construction of the UV system upgrades at the plant uh, as the uh, UV uh, facility that's in place now is, is actually discontinued. Um, the Beechwood Road Trunk Water Main Project, and that's, that's really uh, part and parcel of the West End Depot, and, and in order to um, construct the elevated water tower. There's some prerequisite uh, water main extensions necessary to have a loop system in the West End. We have two local improvement projects that will continue into 2023, including Mapleside Drive as well as Joanne Crescent, and these are both local improvement projects and uh, paid for through the benefiting owners. Um, we spoke briefly about the Schoonertown Bridge carryover this morning. And we have a water valve exercising and maintenance trailer identified uh, to help uh, not only safety uh, of our staff exercising valves throughout the community, but also uh, for increased efficiency in terms of how many they can do in any given day. And we have the replacement of our sewer uh, camera sewer equipment uh, for, for this year. Drainage projects, uh, two projects underway. Uh, subject to property, we do have the Constance and Thomas Overland Flow Route construction uh, identified, as well as the West End drainage improvements, the detailed design. And this, uh, the West End improvements is specific to George, Marilyn, Robert, and Beechwood. And this was in response to a study undertaken last year, as well as uh, area petitions uh, to help address uh, drainage in that area. Uh, we're working with the MTO hoping that we can leverage some provincial funds because some of the challenges we're experiencing in our side streets are the result of uh, drainage deficiencies along Beechwood, which is, remains under the jurisdiction of the MTO. Um, another very busy year in parks. Uh, we're, we're excited to, to uh, advance uh, several playground uh, construction projects, not just new, but replacement. We have a new project slated for the east end at uh, River Road East and in and around Albert Street. We have a town owned lot that we'd like to address uh, some of the park needs throughout the community. We're well aware of the gaps we have in our playground infrastructure in the east end of town as well as the west end. And we hope to address that certainly the east end with this project and then the west end we are looking to advance the uh, detailed design for the park block in the Zancor development on Ramblewood Drive. And uh, in, in the following year is when we hope to construct that park block. We spoke briefly again about Second Street Boat Launch this morning in terms of getting that design completed uh, such that it's pre prepared for uh, reconstruction concurrently with our beachfront construction project. 
and we have the replacement infrastructure, uh, playground infrastructure at the RecPlex, which is at end of life and requires uh, attention. Uh, finally, uh, the next phase of the wayfinding signage program, we're working with our economic development team uh, to advance the uh, tourism and information directional signage through town. Outer Transit, uh, each year we try and put in two new transit shelters uh, throughout our network and uh, we do have uh, OCIP transit stream funding to help offset those costs. And we're also looking to um, explore the uh, possibility of implementing on-demand uh, software and technology uh, this year through uh, a quick feasibility study early on in the year and then hopefully implementation by uh, Q2, Q3 and a subject to it being feasible, of course. That generally summarizes the, the Public Works Department, and if I may, I'll just speak briefly on the fleet, and then we can ask kind of Public Works related. So fleet uh, also uh, falls under the Public Works Department. Um, the next two slides I, I should advise, uh, although there are many replacement vehicles identified, uh, the, our mechanics and fleet manager continue with their vehicle condition assessments just to confirm that they are in fact at a point where we do need to replace them. So uh, this may very well change for draft two. The new vehicles identified are specific to um, the staffing needs that have been identified by the various departments uh, this year. And we also have, I think the, the fire chief had spoke briefly about the pumper refurbishments and we have the electric ice resurfacer for the new arena identified as, as Chris will speak to you possibly. Uh, with respect to maintenance equipment, we have a couple of replacements identified for one of the sidewalk machines as well as one of the industrial blowers for our tractor. And we have a couple of riding mowers that are end of life and require uh, replacement. And that, uh, your worship, generally summarizes a, a quick overview and of notable highlights for the proposed uh, public works budget. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, questions or comments from Council? Councillor Eagle. Thank you, through your worship. I would just like to uh, thank Kevin particularly for in our budget um, binder that you were good enough to put together a visual for us and some verbiage that made it so easy to understand or a great help. Um, what I was really happy about in particular were uh, when you knock on doors a lot uh, in a campaign, you certainly do get to know your town a little better. And I'm very appreciative of the spaces or the areas where I'm seeing sidewalks and bicycle lanes. I would turn from one to another and they were all commenting on that or, or the majority were and I think that's such a huge um, item in our town. And also the parks. Um, I've seen some about town that have been done and they're great. And yes, in particular, I'm happy about the one in the east end as it was lacking and it happens to be a corner I've gone past millions of times since living here. And I've always been able to envision swings on that corner. Um, right around Albert and uh, my Zuzu's, uh, Woo Woo's area there. And uh, so thank you for that. It was, uh, but it was the visual that was very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Eagle. Councillor Belanger. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I have a few questions, uh, mainly around, uh, well, first of all, I, I believe that the, the next phase of River Road West has now been brought forward a year. If my understanding is correct, I think that had been slated for one year later uh, at the last budget. But uh, if that's the case, that's exciting because I do believe it's a priority. Uh, often we have been successful on major road projects in uh, acquiring grants. Uh, I, I haven't heard too much about uh, applications being requested to move forward of council. I, uh, obviously, governments have spent a lot of money through COVID, so I don't know uh, if we're into grant season or we anticipate that that availability will not be there this year. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, anything we can do to investigate that and move it forward. And on that same note, uh, when we talk about the on-demand transit, uh, there were quite a few modernization grants over the last couple of years, and again, I don't know if there's anything available. Uh, my last two comments on the carryover from the force main uh, unbudgeted uh, requirement of 3.36. 
my recollection isn't perfect i can't remember what the original budget on that was but i i thought the original budget was less but are we carrying over the full amount even though a good part of the work was done last year or i'll i'll pause to let you respond to that if i may mr mayor uh, yeah, certainly the draft two will reflect actuals. Um, I think the whole contract may have been in and around three, three and a half. So um, definitely um, half of it was expensed in 2022. I just don't know the, the firm number in terms of what's carried over. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, all three pipes have now been pulled. And really what's going to uh, remain for uh, completion in the spring is really just the final sidewalk and curb restoration. They'll have to redo the asphalt. That was a temporary fix to open up that second lane uh, for the winter but um, the, there was considerable work done there were certainly delays in 2022 to, to get the work to to where it is today but um, we're on budget and, and there shouldn't be any surprises there just my uh, final comment is uh, and I, I I thought it felt uh, fell within public works but the electrical vehicle vehicle charging systems I know that there's some of that on the books and uh, also related to that I'm uh, hopefully some point next year we would be in a position to consider electric vehicles as part of the fleet uh, I don't know if there's been a lot of dialogue on that yet uh, but uh, I'm hopeful just Mr. Mayor if I may through you um, yeah so we, as you're aware we have applied and we're successful for funding through uh, RTO 7 build fund, I believe, as well as the EPCOR and our CAN fund that they're um, administering. Uh, so you will see certainly the ones here. There's two level two stations um, identified for town hall, and we've done the, the underground work. So there's there's a station coming to town hall. There's a charging station that will be installed at uh, the Nancy Island lot. There's one at the Recplex. There's a high fast charger at the Oakview Woods. And I, we do have uh, underground infrastructure in place for the arena, and there's other funding opportunities to advance the EV charging stations at the arena. Um, I think there's capacity for 20. So there, we, we certainly have uh, leveraged the funding to get to where we are today. I think um, corporately, there's, there is a plan for, for next year to look at more of a, a kind of electrification feasibility study because uh, we need to make sure we have the infrastructure in place before we start to uh, get too far along on our electric vehicle uh, purchases. Um, and we just need to make sure that, you know, the ones that we have here uh, at Town Hall, uh, they are public, but you could come in, you know, if, if we do advance too many vehicles too soon, um, there's going to be competition for that charging uh, space. So uh, we just need to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place before we just uh, start to buy electric vehicles. But there is a lot of funding available for that and um, it's it's certainly a priority for our new fleet manager that's that's part of his portfolio and, and he will be uh, the lead on that uh, as he gets his his feet what he just started uh, last week so we're, we're trying to get him first in uh, uh, certainly the inventory and, and the various departments but it's it is a priority for us as well councillor so the fleet manager didn't fleet manager didn't bring electric vehicles with him But you know. <laughs> I'm surprised you had to answer that, Kevin. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Snell, did you have a comment or question? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I had the, a similar question as uh, Councillor Blanche, looking at a $1.5 million in, <clears throat> in vehicles. Can I ask, what's um, normally the life cycle of a vehicle? Because when I look in our parking lot, these vehicles look fa fancy and new to me. But uh, what, what typically is the timeline, please? Uh, it depends on, like, let's say the pickup trucks are usually seven years, but it depends on the department and its use. Seven years in public works is certainly different than seven years in, in bylaw. Um, however, I, I should highlight um, what we do after the seven years is we also maintain a vehicle surplus pool. So even though they may be at their end of useful life at seven years, they, de they then fall into a surplus pool, and we have a pool of vehicles that we deploy uh, during our peak season. So... Uh, parks will bring in a dozen staff, PW will have 10 or 12 facilities, and bylaw will bring on bylaw enforcement officers. We use that pool of vehicles to, um, to ensure that they have 
the uh, the vehicles they need to get out into the community. So it's not at seven years we get rid of it. It actually then, um, you know, the condition assessments are done and then it actually falls through into that surplus pool that's then used corporately for those peak times. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that with the price of gas and, and just with mindfulness, you're obviously always trying to look at what's the most efficient, cost-effective way to, to execute. Um, but you know, in terms of bylaw and some of you know um, some of the roles that are going around stopping at houses, but not necessarily carrying large items with them, would it make sense to have a smaller, compact vehicle that's more fuel efficient and that sort of thing? Is that being considered in in this request of, of additional vehicles? Certainly, we don't dictate what the department um, must have, and, and I think bylaw can speak to what their their needs are, and, and I think compact vehicles make more sense in, in that regard. So, um, our, the, the purpose of the fleet manager is really to understand what the needs are and, and look at the most cost-effective way that uh, that we can advance their their needs. So. Um, not necessarily does it need to be a truck, but in some cases, perhaps bylaw may need a truck, but uh, it, it's not a fixed unit per department. It's really just uh, what, what makes the most sense, and it could be a, a smart car, for instance, or, or, or what have you. But um, I know we've advanced an e-bike in the department, and I know hybrid vehicles are certainly uh, have been of, of conversation with, with the bylaw department. So everything's on the table, and, and we're, we should certainly have... Uh, uh, an interest in advancing that green fleet and reducing our carbon footprint, certainly with the, the light duty vehicles. The heavy duty, we're not quite there yet with, with the cost, but um, that's that's something that is considered with, uh, with every vehicle. Thank you. Um, so, so what it sounds like is it, uh, with this request, if it's approved, you're thinking that this would then be handed to the fleet manager to do a thorough assessment and, and then collectively decide where to allocate those funds or what types of vehicles to purchase. So it's open to green vehicles as well, is what you're saying? It is open to it, but you know, we also need to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to charge it. And, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that if we're going to be purchasing six vehicles that we have dedicated chargers for our fleet um, I, I say this because I know our fleet manager is coming from the city of, Rich, uh, city of Richmond Hill and they've deployed public um, fleet facilities at their operation center, at their town hall uh, with the vision to charge their own vehicles but what they're finding is it's being occupied by private uh, or public vehicles and they're actually charging it overnight and um, you know they're they're charging it for four hours and having their kids sit in the back of the vehicle while they're charging the vehicle so we just need to be mindful of uh, of how that infrastructure is going to accommodate and and there's going to be conflicting interests so uh, like I said we want to make sure that the, the the charging stations are in place for our fleet um, before uh, we get too far along on, on purchasing a dozen or what have you uh, electric vehicles. Okay, I just have one final question. If that's okay. Yes, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank, thank you. Um, just a comment. Very glad to hear about the sidewalks in front of Birch Street Dunes. Um, many, many families will be very happy to see that coming along for safety. Um, and I'm not sure if it's a question for yourself or for uh, the, the treasurer. Um, in regards to the playgrounds, the two that are noted for the developments. Um, there's one for Zancor and one for Elm. Is that the 300,000 that's been assigned? Is that is that the 300,000 coming from the obligatory reserve funds for Parkland to pay for those two playgrounds, please? The the new developments are development charge driven, so those are coming from DCs. Um, the replacements, not necessarily. So Elm is a new park that's DC driven. Zancor is a new park that's DC driven. And the, the, the benchmark cost for new playground infrastructure as well as the drainage facilities that follow and the curbing and what have you and the amenities from uh, seating or, or shade structures is about 300, 330,000 as, as we've seen. So um, it's the obligatory reserves, I'm assuming are the development charges in terms of how the, the treasurers finance that. If I may, I'll just add to that and just say, um, yes, the, the obligatory reserves do um, include the, D, the DCs. However, um, for the playground structures that are replacements, 
generally we will, with replacement assets, do 50% taxation and 50% from our capital replacement reserve. So we do a blended uh, financing in most cases, not all the time, but that's a general policy practice that we follow. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Schnell. Uh, Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Director Lalonde, my question is about uh, Beach Drive design detail carryover. And I'm just wondering with the um, uh, status of the beachfront redevelopment, if this is something that needs to be uh, finalized in, in 2023, sorry, <coughs> um, based on what level of construction might be coming forward and when. I, I th through you, Mr. Mayor. I think, so we've advanced the majority of the design. We've had to put a hold on the design in terms of um, the sewer upgrades, the pump station upgrades. So I, I think once we go through the strategic exercise with the CAO and understanding the priorities over the next four years, it'll help better define that. What we do know is we still, uh, there are property matters down there that we still need to address and that budget is primarily to uh, initiate that conversation and to address those matters. So. Um, provided uh, the scope of work remains consistent, I, ideally it'd be nice to finish it this year, but definitely the property matters have to be uh, in, undertaken this year. Go ahead, Councillor. Um, so just to confirm, the streetscape portion of it is, is not what we're talking about here. It's more infrastructure and uh, uh, necessary road work. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, it, it's it's everything. So it's Mosley Street as well as the streetscaping. It's the sewer along Mosley Street. It's the pump station upstream, um, and and the expansion that's needed to accommodate the growth uh, at uh, opposite the Dicony. I think is where that pump station is. It's looking at the design and streetscaping for Spruce Street, Third Street, and Beach Drive as well as the shore wall. So all of that is, um, you know, Beach Drive itself is probably. 75% complete, um, and then the streetscaping for the balance is, is uh, about the same. So it's it's well underway. It's just really we've had to put a hold on on uh, the project simply because of uh, understanding the densities that are going to be down there, but also the phasing and if there's going to be now a, a phasing program. Uh, at which point uh, there's some challenges with with phasing, for instance, Beach Drive. If we phase it at First Street. Uh, you know, you're elevating the road five feet, you're setting it back, you know, 30 feet, uh, what that transition looks like from the new road to the old. There's an existing pump station uh, that's in that intersection that needs to be realigned. So there's, there's a lot of details that we need to address. Um, I, I, personally, I think in 2023, so we are well prepared to, to hit the, the ground running with, with infrastructure improvements when that time comes. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments from Council? All right, um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, I think it's important to, to re-note again the amount of provincial downloading and, and the legislative costs that are downloaded basically to our communities. And, and we're seeing this more and more. We've seen it over the last 10 years. Uh, I used to refer to it as, uh, you know, download by stealth. It's uh, you, you wake up one morning and there's a whole lot more cost sitting on municipalities' desks because the province has said we can't afford it, so you deal with it. Uh, and that, uh, that has been happening and it's going to continue to happen, uh, make no mistake about it. Um, it's also important to note that our staffing levels here are low. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, considerable uh, turnover in the, in, in the last uh, few years and, and uh, so it's low from that and, and uh, it's just low on an operational level. Uh, I think to you know carry on with the day-to-day -day operations never mind as we delve into uh, new operations and and uh, and new projects so um, these are uh, you know we, we will hear uh, often uh, that uh, you know municipalities or government uh, is uh, this this large pool of people that do very little and I I think it's very important for us to point out to the public that that is not the case here in Wasaga Beach for certain. Um, these folks are working hard and uh, they are overtaxed and that is going to create a much bigger problem for us in future uh, from a health and safety standpoint if we do not deal with it very quickly. Um, 
The, the uh, electric vehicles, I think it's important, I understand, Kevin, that we have to have the infrastructure in place, um, but are, have we spent any time, we're, we're, it seems to me like we're, we're talking about going from gas-powered vehicles, combustible engines, to electric uh, straight through. Has there been any conversation or should we be looking at hybrids so at least there is some savings there uh, until we get to a point where we are... Uh, are capable of going to full electric vehicles. It certainly, Mr. Mayor, that, that was the priority of the clerk's office uh, this past year, and, and I know Rachel had mentioned that again in our recent conversation. So the opportunity is there, but I just caution, the, the infrastructure needs to be in place as well, and we don't want to have a cart and horse issue where we've, we've purchased uh, vehicles and, and don't have a true plan or perhaps the electrical capacity to to install um, the infrastructure we need and, and understanding the extent of um, you know the electrical needs that may uh, need to support a fleet um, but definitely it's 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 a possibility and it's not off the table but I just think uh, a fulsome review um, needs to be done so the true cost is presented to council and they have a a long-term understanding of, of the infrastructure and, and uh, um, just what's needed. So it's, it is a certain possibility and, and we, we uh, welcome that discussion when, when we do pass the budget. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Belanger. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just adding to your comment uh, about uh, resources uh, and Bill 23. Bill 23, as my understanding, puts more pressure on timing of getting work done and that there's potential penalty for not meeting those timelines. But in addition to that, uh, we are limited to our revenue streams within a municipality and one of those revenue streams is how quickly we process through development projects and get to our ability of collecting development charges. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, we have had some challenges in the past and that's uh, one area that, that we really need to look at because there, there is opportunity to increase revenues if we invest in resources effectively. Thank you, Councillor. All right, thank you, uh, Kevin. Great, great report, moving on. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll pass the floor over to Doug Heron, our Director of Planning Economic Development. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, for the low, low price of uh, 1.7 million, you get planning and development services. Uh, the, um, what we have in, in the slide here are the major policy projects that uh, the staff are working on. Um, the, the main roles of the planning department are implementation being, meaning the, the processing of development applications, um, the creation of development policy, and that's uh, what the first uh, four items are on the bullets under operations, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. We also are heavily involved in uh, special projects that the town might be involved in and council might direct us to pursue. and. Um, the uh, and then we uh, a large part of our day is um, addressing public concerns and, and res responding to them. Um, I can tell you that uh, within that 1.7 million, uh, the wages account for four planners, two senior planners, a manager of planning. We have a planning navigator, which is designed to take some load off the planners to help the speed up the. Um, the process and we have a planning administrator. Uh, at this point in time, um, the planning department uh, has is the, the most staffed that it has ever been in the history of Wasaga Beach, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, we don't know yet what the full re, uh, impact of Bill 23 will be upon the, the planning department. Um, we're hoping to be able to address it with the current complement um, as, as an aside. Uh, we do know that the province uh, has, um, through legislation, decided that the county planning department will no longer exist. So if we need some planners, I think I know where we can get some. Um, but, and they're good, they're good people. I can tell you that um, the, this morning at coordinated committee, uh, your worship, you mentioned that, um, you know, it might be wise to have some public outreach to explain to the public where we're going with things in the town of Wasaga Beach. And with the official plan update, the West End Secondary Plan update, and the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, 
um, within the, probably the second quarter of this year, we will be going out to the public to get uh, input from the public and to deliver the, the, the uh, proposed policies to the public. So that might present an excellent opportunity for messaging to the public on, in terms of uh, where we're going with uh, development in town. And um, the, uh, the affordable housing proposal, that's something that has been rolled over for, I think, three years now uh, for various reasons. Through COVID, we just couldn't get to it. We didn't have enough staff. At, at, uh, at one point, we had three planners. And uh, through Danny's numbers, you've seen that uh, we've had record numbers. So those three planners were pretty busy. Um, and we couldn't get into some of the special projects. But with affordable housing being such an important um, matter across the country right now, um, bef in the fall of last year, I had a discussion with the director of planning for uh, um, Collingwood, also the director of planning for the county, and we were thinking this might be a good time to pool our resources um, and take that 40000 and add it to their 40000 and come up with ways that we can actually create affordable housing. And we don't, we're thinking, all three of us are thinking we don't want um, new policies in terms of incentives. We, we actually want to create the units. Uh, so there is some, some groundswell out there. And that's the reason the 40 grand is, is still in the budget today. It's, uh, it, it, um, it, it does have a purpose to an end. Um, the contract planning consultant for 25,000, um, we have hired WSP planning consultants over the past three years because we were very shy on planning staff and um, at one point we had three planners doing the work of six planners. Uh, so they were each trying to make up 2,000 hours a year on top of their own 2,000 hours a year. So we hired WSP as extra planners. Um, with the full complement of staff we have today, um, the goal is to re continue to retain WSP because they have expertise that we don't have in-house, things like urban design. So as we get into more um, internal urban projects and there's more impacts directly upon the neighbors and there's more intens intensification, urban design becomes so much more important. And um, so that's why we have 25,000 in the budget to keep them retained for their expertise. Um, under the proposed draft two changes, um, in terms of Bill 23 impacts, uh, Kevin mentioned it a little bit earlier, and Councillor Belanger just brought it up as well. Under Bill 23, uh, the, the province has uh, directed that if the decision authority, in this case the town, doesn't render decisions within a timely manner, we have to give the planning application fees back. No questions asked, it just has to be returned upon hitting a certain date. Uh, to mitigate that, we've adjusted our application fees upward by 50%. That was a decision earlier of this council. Um, another impact is that the Conservation Authority, they, did, they had two roles with the town. The first role was they, they um, had their own authority in terms of permitting for hazards, but they also assisted the town with providing their expertise on natural heritage, meaning wetlands and species at risk. Uh, as of January 1st, the province has directed that they can, conservation authorities can no longer do that, which puts us in a bind. We under, are under legislative, legislative direction to process applications within a finite timeline, but we don't have the expertise to turn to for natural heritage. And almost every property that gets developed in Wasaga Beach is a butts, a wetland, or a forest. Or So staff are working on a solution to that right now. Uh, we expect to report forward to Council on it soon. We don't fully understand what the financial impact of that will be. It is quite likely that it will be a chargeback, so eventually the developer will pay, but we may have, uh, we may need a carry-in cost for it anyway. Uh, so there are some unknowns uh, in the impacts of Bill 23, and that's, that's two of them. Um, moving on to economic development. Uh, the first two items under operations, the tourism partnerships and the economic development in initiatives, those are the two largest budget items in the economic development budget. Um, and for tourism partnerships, we have a multitude of partnerships um, that we help support. Um, the first, the two listed here are the South Georgian Bay Tourism uh, Group, and it's a, a membership fee. 
And the second one, of course, is RTO7. And we've benefited from both. Um, our, particularly with RTO7, they've assisted us with, uh, with grants, they've assisted us with uh, photo stock for the, very, the four seasons that you're now starting to see posted on Google when you, uh, when you get on Google and, and uh, things come to you. So, um, and then um, further down in economic development initiatives, um, there are some goals that have come out of the economic development strategy, some sub-goals and targets. And that's what you're seeing here, the incubator study for $10,000. Uh, the Proud to Be was like a beach campaign for $5,000. Uh, beautification strategy for $25,000. It's interesting to note that there seems to be some um, symbiosis of thinking um, in a discussion with the chair of the ACT Committee, the Advisory Committee on Tourism. Uh, he has a background in corporate marketing, and um, he was promoting that the committee uh, take on town beautification. And I loved the way he explained it. He said that, you know, if you're, if it's, you're hosting guests, it's Christmas, and you're having guests to your house, you want to clean your house, and you want to put out your best decorations for your house. You want to put on, make it look good for your guests, clean sheets. And he said, that's Wasaga Beach. When you're welcoming the tourists to town, you want to make the town look like it's welcoming and fresh and open. So uh, that's part of the rationale behind the, the beautification strategy and the Proud to Be Wasaga Beach campaign. And, and those recommendations came right out of the economic development strategy. So there's, you can see that there is a, a collective of uh, how we should uh, uh, go forward with our business. Um, the development, the development agreement incentives for 25,000 is related directly to the downtown development master plan and the community improvement plan. Um, when the town approved the community improvement plan, uh, the idea was to focus uh, development on the main street between Beck Street and the bridge. And we needed to, to have some money put aside in case any of the developers or landowners in that sector of town um, requested uh, incentives through the community improvement plan. So that's what that 25000 is for. We have had it in the budget for four years now. Uh, there has been no uptake. We have um, pre-consultations for several properties within that area, and we've, staff have made it known to those landowners that this money is available to you, um, and it, you know, show us how you might need it. But there's been no uptake. It, um, each through pre-consultation, they've all said, yeah, well, we don't think we need it. Um, but I think it's worthwhile keeping it. In fact, we may want to consider expanding that somehow geographically or as we look at uh, further development on the main street. The facade improvement program has been a success story for Wasaga Beach. Um, as little as two years ago, we only had $5,000 in it. And there's been suffi sufficient demand and uptake on it that uh, we, I mean, we already have um, a report today we looked at for a facade improvement, and uh, so it's money well spent. Um, and then, bear with me. In terms of capital, uh, very minor matters. Um, there's uh, for planning um, is a, a typical standard three thousand five hundred dollars that tends to be for chairs and desks, uh, and so on. Uh, the bigger one is under economic development. Uh, we've included $100,000, and that goes back to the Proud to be Wasaga Beach, um, and it's for the installation of at least one entrance sign into Wasaga Beach. Uh, the graphic that is on there comes from the wayfinding plan, and the sign was prepared by Entro, the consultant. Um, it's it's descriptive, a beautiful sign. I, personally, I like it, but um, th that's not specifically the sign that's been approved for install. Uh, there isn't a sign yet that's been approved for install. So we're looking f uh, for $100,000 for capital to at least put in one sign. Um, there are three, four different entrances into town, so eventually there would be more signs uh, that we would hope to install. And the idea is that it's not just the install of a sign, but uh, uh, having a place where you could pull off with your car and take a selfie in front of the sign, um, I have arrived. 
I'm here, I made it to Wasaga Beach. Uh, something that the people can be proud of as well as uh, somebody from Wasaga Beach. Interesting thing about that sign that's up there, you can see when it's turned on its side, um, the colors, the blue, the green waves, the sunsets, um, they are plastic pieces installed in front of the signboard and at night the plastic would be lit up so those colors would show up in a, with a depth to it. So it was a very interesting concept prepared by Intro. And that effectively wraps up my presentation. Thank you very much, Doug. Questions or comments for Doug and planning and economic development? Councillor uh, Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Director Heron. Um, I, before you started talking about the, why the beautification strategy was in the economic development uh, budget, I had made notes of that because I was puzzled about it. And um, I do have a question. Most of our town beautification comes from public works, is that correct? Out of, sorry, sorry, Director Lalonde. Uh, certainly, that, that we have one gardener who maintains the beautification features, hanging baskets, uh, gardens, and that, those features, yes. So I was just wondering how well we would be able to implement that through economic development. Um, and, and the analogy about changing sheets, I, I get that, but I wonder wh what kind of uh, Main Street beautification is the uh, Tourism Advisory Committee talking about? Uh, th through you, Your Worship, at, at this point the discussion hasn't been had because there's only been one meeting of the Tourism Advisory Committee before we went into Lame Belt and the election. So there, that was a discussion that I'd ha uh, I had with the Chair um, likely August, maybe September. And uh, so th it's something that, that the Chair would like to put on the table, but in the budget what it is is uh, an actual study which emanates as a recommendation out of the economic development strategy. So what would beautification actually look like and, and what would be the implementation of that? What would it look like? So um, there is some coincident um, direction from the study and then the similar thinking from the chair. Thank you. I would add that, um, sorry, the uh, in terms of uh, budgets and uh, between departments. Uh, you may have noted earlier in Kevin's presentation that I think he has $60,000 in his budget for wayfinding. Um, so the $100,000 that's being recommended by economic development need not necessarily be in the economic development budget. It could easily be in the, in the Public Works Department subject to, to Council's consideration of that. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I really love the sign. I think it's beautiful, and I, I think it would look fantastic lit up at nighttime. Um, our signs have always looked a little sad, and it seems that you know, back when the county had put a, a, a fund together to to so each municipality could apply for the signs, it's unfortunate. I don't know if we took advantage of that, but um, my thought is one one thing I've always wanted to see, especially now with the casino there, is a sign at the west end. Um, there's going to be a lot of traffic there, a lot of folks going there, and I would love a big billboard that says, you are five minutes away from this, and an aerial shot of, of Wasaga Beach. Has there been any consideration from an economic development perspective in terms of your strategy to, to get more signage at the West End or to put some dollars to try to draw them from the casino? Um, in terms of draw from the casino, I don't know that we've looked at it to that depth. The wayfinding plan um, would have looked at that. Um, I keep using the word coincidental, but it is. Um, just last week, Kevin sent us an email advising that the town entrance sign on Sunnydale Road is actually located on private lands, and also that the sign coming in at Lyons Court is pretty faded. So it kind of puts it front and center on our radar that w we need to pay attention to this. In, in terms of the thought of um, coming into town at the West End, um, through, the gr through the OP update, we're looking at the West End as being one of the major nodes, similar to the downtown node, and um, ripe and fresh. So um, there hasn't been any formal direction at the directive at this, but uh, what we're looking at is as we update the secondary plan and the official plan, 
to show how the West End could be its own entity, its own uh, mini village, just like the downtown will be when it's built, um, incorporating signage into that overall plan and where would it fit. There would be a lot of work with the MTO because they own most of the roadways coming into town um, from the larger roundabout on the highway right through to the roundabout on um, Lions Court slash uh, Beechwood Drive. So placing a town sign in there involves third parties. There's a lot of ramifications. All that to say, yes, I think that um, w we do anticipate that there would be a sign coming in at that west end. It's one of the primary entranceways to town. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. If you wouldn't mind to go back a couple of slides, please. Around the... Um, um, sorry, next one forward. The beautification strategy for 25,000, is your thought that that's going to be a strategy, like a document that guides, or is that actual boots on the street initiatives, getting things done and making changes, like entranceway signs or painting areas or planting some stuff, please? Uh, the thought would be both. Uh, we need both some direction and some implementation action. And that's what we hope to draw from the beautification strategy. We've not prepared an RFP on that one yet. Um, but um, once the budget is secured, then we, we, we would move forward. Go ahead. My, my personal thought in regards to the entranceway sign, as much as I love it, I think that we heard from this table uh, a few meetings ago that there's a lot of um, question and needed conversation in regards to the brand and the logo and the messaging. Uh, personally, myself, I love the wayfinding signage. I think it's bright and colorful and playful and I really like the fonts. Um, but clearly, we need to come up with a, an overall branding strategy before we allocate $100,000 in signage is, is my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Snell. Uh, Councillor Belanger. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, mine uh, is related to beautification as well. And uh, I, I feel as a resident of Wasega Beach, I am, uh, I'm, I'm proud of Wasega Beach. I think our natural assets are second to none. Uh, but I think we're losing ground on what we're offering our residents and what we're offering visitation as far as brick and mortar or those uh, Yahoo moments. Uh, certainly the Wasega light up sign on the beach was uh, a good start and uh, you can see that it attracts attention but I think there's a lot more opportunity there. Uh, there, there will be some revenues uh, that haven't been included or allocated in the budget related to the casino and um, I would like to s see the beautification budget to be more significant and that uh, that every year uh, we're making a visual difference to our residents in one area or another, and that that also uh, creates increased visitation. And uh, you know, although that's not the easiest thing to measure, uh, whether you're a day tripper or whether you stay for, for a week, there's still a contribution to our economy. Obviously, we want the longer stays, but. I think we really have to look at that hard because uh, I, I personally, there's some things that occur in our town and are occurring and that haven't been effectively addressed that frankly make us look pretty bad. And first impression uh, matters. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Belanger. Uh, Councillor Timms. Thank you, Worship. Director. Heron, I was just wondering about the doctor recruitment line item. It's only $1,000, but it has not been spent um, in 21 or 22. And that item was heard by many of us during our campaign as being so important to the, the people in Wasega Beach. Can, can you update us on the thought behind it? The, um, the doctor recruitment line within the economic development budget is $1,000. And it's meant to allow for attendance at any recruitment function by staff. Uh, the larger doctor recruitment budget is actually under the CAO's uh, administration budget. 
Um, and uh, it, but, however, having said that, um, there really has been not much action that I'm aware of on the town's part to perform doctor recruitment over the past uh, two years. Certainly, um, COVID did put a dent in that because we typically would attend the, 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 the doctor um, uh, the seminars that, and we would uh, show up with um, uh, a presentation table and uh, dr you know bring interest to, uh, to Wasaga Beach. Um, in the budget, we do have a budget to actually create. Uh, we, what we didn't have was uh, the, the the backboard, the expandable backboard that you could travel with. We didn't have the table. We didn't have a little computer. So we didn't have a, a, a traveling roadshow, as it were. So we have budget in that. Uh, th I think it was last year, and the order has been made to uh, to acquire that material, and it can also be used um, for uh, uh, if we have ribbon cuttings or uh, you know a signing, it can be used in the town hall as a backdrop. So we were thinking um, getting more money out of or more usage out of the the product. But to go back to your original question, um, there, there really hasn't been a lot of effort, to my knowledge, in terms of doctor recruitment at the town. Um, and I know that there was a lot of discussion about the walk-in clinic and the, uh, the immense amount of effort that went into the walk-in clinic. And it was, um, uh, there was some um, disappointment that uh, it, it no longer exists. So I appreciate the question. Thank you, uh, Doug. Uh, Councillor Timms, go ahead. No follow-up? No follow okay. Councillor uh, DeLay. Thank you, Worship. This is for Director Lalonde. You wind oh. Lucky you. You indicated we have one gardener for all of Wasaga Beach. Is that correct? Correct. Do you see it in the future, maybe get another one or a couple more? Um. I'm very interested in the scope of the beautification strategy, certainly from an implementation and staffing perspective that will um, help me respond to that question. Uh, we are definitely challenged with our staffing levels right now to maintain the features we do have. In fact, we've had to remove features because of challenges with staffing levels. So um, we will be actively involved with the beautification strategy and, and we'll be sharing our um, position on, on how best to implement. Um, certainly we're, we're anxious to improve um, the aesthetics and the visibility of, of our features throughout town, but um, it's, you do need the resources to maintain them and to sustain a, an appropriate work plan. So um, we're excited, but we're, we're gonna be heavily involved with uh, understanding the, the implementation strategies. Thank you. I really would like to see another gardener, though, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor DeLeo. Councillor Eagle. Thank you, Your Worship. Sorry that you switched back there, so I'm going to jump in on this part, too. It just, the thought came to me. Um, I don't know if it's ever happened here, but I know many cities in particular have um, volunteers doing gardening. I know North Bay, I've seen their signs. They have a huge contingent of, of their garden clubs and that. So I don't know if we've ever reached out or it's just something to throw out there. Thank you. We do have an active horticultural group that does support certainly the, uh, uh, the garden features at Puccini um, and there are some other ones in town, but I think that's a resource that we can continue to uh, lean upon and perhaps proactively pursue. Uh, but uh, we do have local residents and, and service clubs that are um, involved uh, to some extent, certainly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I'm just going to jump back to Kevin as, as well, if I may. Uh, I, I, my apologies, I forgot to ask. So the extension uh, of River Road West uh, from Veterans Way to Blueberry, uh, what I'd like to see there is uh, I'd like to see you come forth with extending it all the way uh, to uh, Foodland. Uh, so, and, and what the difference is in that cost versus doing it all at once uh, sorry, versus doing it in two separate um, stages. I, I know that's a that's a big bite, but um, it is a, it is a major uh, impact on our traffic uh, through town, and so I think that's where we plan to end it anyway. Uh, so I'd like to see us uh, have some kind of information come back on 
on, on that as well as uh, uh, sidewalks, uh, completing sidewalks all the way out to uh, probably the Elm development. And, and I'm not saying that to be in this year's budget, but I would like to see that information come to us as soon as possible. Uh, I can tell you that uh, it's a big concern for many residents, especially uh, residents with young school children. Um, then the, the other piece uh, back to you, uh, Doug, is the affordable housing uh, and your point about joining forces with Collingwood and the county. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea. Affordable housing is an absolute need uh, in this community. We do have 99 units uh, on Zoo Park, but we could use another 299 more, there's no doubt. Uh, so uh, I, I appreciate uh, your sentiment on that. I think it's a good idea how we go about that. I think we leave up to the experts to figure that out, but uh, I also believe we should be having some further conversation in the very near future uh, with the County of Simcoe to complete the, uh, the back 99 units, if you will, uh, on Zoo Park. And that's my comments. Uh, if you have any comments back, uh, Doug, if not, we'll move on. No, I'll pass over the wand. Thank you, and we're now moving on uh, to building. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, before I get into the numbers, I just, I just want to uh, provide a, a really quick synopsis of how the building department budget is constructed. Most of the same principles apply that apply across municipal budgeting, but um, within the Building Code Act, it is it, there are some very, very specific things that, that we have to address for our budgeting. Um, so typically our, our fees are set so as to recover our costs in an average year of development. And within the costs that we're allowed to recover in an average year are the direct costs of operating the department, so any staff within the department or any direct capital costs of operating the department. And then something that the Act refers to as indirect costs. So, in other words, uh, as we exist within this municipal organization, there are cost recoveries that are available to the Treasury Department, uh, to HR, to uh, the CAO's office. And it, it may appear as a recovery for administration, but that, for you know, the purpose of setting the building department budget, is considered an indirect cost of administering the service. And, and then I, I think I heard Craig mention briefly earlier, one of the other areas where we're allowed to allocate revenues that we collect in the form of building permit fees is uh, through an agreement with our municipal fire department that they provide um, uh, either plan examination or uh, plan examination services or, or aid us in the commissioning of fire systems within new buildings. So Craig and I have, have had that conversation and, and we're looking to explore those opportunities. So um, with that sort of said, I'll just jump into the numbers a little bit. So the, the cost to operate our department um, in terms of expenditures, our operating expenditures is $902,000 and included in that is about $85,000 in indirect costs. Uh, when we were preparing our draft one budget, um, we used a projection of 350 new dwelling units. So that reflected revenue of um, $606,000 in building permit revenue. And then associated with every new dwelling unit that we create, uh, we actually treat our water and sewer permits. It says water and sewer revenue there, I guess, which could be a little bit confusing, but really what that is is, is um, a permit fee associated with the connection of, of the sanitary sewer and, and the water line. And then we collect a small amount uh, in other revenues um, just for services that we provide within our municipal corporation um, in terms of licensing and whatnot. Um, so based on the number, uh, and if I said 350 earlier, I, I apologize, I meant 250. So we projected 250 new bills next year. Um, so that would leave us a shortfall in terms of revenues that we would draw from our reserve. Uh, and that number would be $289,000. Um, we do have a small uh, capital uh, allowance for $1,000 in, in furniture within the department, so I guess somebody's getting a new chair next year. Um, for, for draft two, um, you know, we're, we know quite a bit more now than we did uh, when we prepared the draft one budget, and, and we do see that the numbers are coming down quite a bit. 
Um, so we are, we are proposing uh, the creation of 150 dwelling units, which would uh, see a reduction of $242,000 in the revenue that we projected in our, our first draft. Uh, you see a, also a reduction in the water and sewer connection permit, uh, and therefore an increase um, in what we would have to draw from our reserve to cover our costs. Um, you do see, uh, you see on the slide that we also would like to continue uh, our relationship. We established a, a relationship with a building code consultant uh, back in 2021, I believe it was, and we'd like to carry on that relationship uh, through 2023. Um, and it is for everything from inspection services to uh, helping us. We, we regularly bring in students uh, from Georgian College and that individual is a very seasoned building official that uh, really helps us in terms of a mentorship role uh, with the young students that we're bringing into our department uh, every, every co-op term. And then I, we wanted to um, just include a slide uh, that kind of gives you a sense for how this sort of plays out over time in terms of, you know, uh, as our numbers go up and down, uh, you'll see that in, in years where we've exceeded our expectations um, that we are able to put money into reserve and that our reserve, you know, balance once we see 2022's uh, numbers reflected in it will be quite healthy, uh, but in a year like next year when uh, we are expecting a downturn, uh, we have that that reserve fund to draw from to cover our costs so that uh, we have no impact on the municipal levy. And uh, with that, uh, that concludes my budget presentation. Oh, that would be me, sorry. Oh, me too. There we are. All right, questions or comments for our uh, director of building? Councillor Blanchet. Thank you, Your Worship. You skipped over the two electric vehicles. I think oh. that uh, <laughs> may, maybe you thought we covered that well enough, but uh, maybe you could just say that very loudly after I... Uh, uh, the other thing uh, that I just want to confirm, I believe is correct, uh, your uh, reserve is obligatory in that uh, the reserve funds for your department can only be used for your department. and. Uh, so uh, even though you're forecasting a $450,000 shortfall, uh, we still can uh, weather a, a bad year or two. Um, absolutely, uh, through your worship, uh, Councillor Balanchet, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the, the funds can only be used for our department and, and we are in a very healthy position in terms of should this downturn last um, longer than what we're expecting now. And I guess I maybe avoided the electric vehicles uh, so as to not get into too deep a discussion with Kevin here. But we did, uh, we did have a, a conversation, Kevin and I, when he brought the uh, new fleet manager around. And I will advocate for the addition of the two electric vehicles to our fleet. Uh, and I do so with, with the thought that, you know, we could repurpose our existing vehicles within the organization. Th so I think, you know, there's a cost savings there, uh, possibly to other departments. Uh, that would, you know, have a positive impact uh, on their impact on the levy. Uh, and, and, you know, in terms of the infrastructure needed, um, you know, that would be a direct cost associated with running the department. So uh, the cost of charging stations or anything associated with us being able to have electric ve vehicles would be something that, again, could come out of our reserve. Um, it would be dependent, obviously, upon uh, the existing infrastructure um, the cost to improve our existing infrastructure if needed not being too exorbitant. Um, but it's a conversation that I, I very much look forward to having with, with Kevin and the new fleet manager in terms of how we can do that because I think we could also, um, you know, serve ourselves up as a good case study uh, as we look at this as an option for the municipality across the board that, you know, possibly within the building department that would help us, um, you know, lay the groundwork for that. Councillor Belanger, do you care to stir up any more hornet's nests? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah just, just as a follow-up uh, follow and looking at your strength of your reserve, Kevin, you may want to consider to have one of your mechanics permanently on staff working on his vehicles out of the public works. Thank you, Councillor. Other questions or comments uh, for the Director of Building? All right, I, I was just going to reiterate that perhaps building uh, could, could uh, leave one of their vehicles over.
public works and then four they should be putting a charging station there and they could pay for that but uh, we'll leave that for another day and we'll also leave uh, it to Kevin and uh, and uh, Danny in the parking lot later to sort this issue out all right moving on next uh, madam treasurer thank you your worship um, we're moving now to the library budget and our um, director of library services and CEO Pam Powell will pre present for this budget Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor Snell, and members of Council. Um, the Library Board and staff have put a great deal of consideration into the 2023 library budget. We want to ensure that the new library is successful when it opens, that it's equipped to uh, run well, but we also understand the importance of being fiscally responsible and conscientious, determining the needs of the library versus the wants. The majority of the library's budget increases in 2023 are tied to either preparations for operations of or construction of the new library. These are some of the highlights of uh, how we're in the preparation mode. Uh, the rebranding materials, we've requested 8.3 thousand. Uh, just we have completed our rebranding exercise at the end of 2022 and we intend to roll out the new brand so that we have a much more dynamic and professional image for the community. Um, the materials we're looking at obtaining range from office materials from new library cards and business materials right up to marketing materials so that we have that new image in and around the community when we're performing outreach. Board consultation legal fees, there are two major projects that the board is working on this year that we may need some consultant assistance on or legal assistance. We're working on a memorandum of understanding between the corporation of the library and the town of Wasaga Beach. And we want to make sure that we have a clear delineation of services provided through the town to the library and, and back. We want to also understand the space use agreement of the new building that we will be part of at 544 River Road West. So we may need some consultation with that document. As well, we will be looking at, I'm assuming at the end of the year, the disposal of the property at 120 Glenwood Drive, which is currently in the possession of the library board. So we may need some assistance with that transition as well. Under new library programming, we're asking just for a moderate $5,000. Uh, we have a lot of funds built into our FF&E budget for the equipping of the actual library building proper. However, we do have some programming features that we would like to add to the new building, both in our learning spaces, our learning labs, as well as to really commemorate what's wonderful about Wasaga Beach and bring it into our building with some special heritage displays as well as a photography contest that we're planning to run this year so that we can post some really enlarged images of Wasaga Beach within our new library. Uh, we're requesting 45.5 thousand in the new budget. We have done some preliminary forecasting for maintenance fees for operating both our current building as well as the new building. Uh, these numbers are based on comparative libraries in and around the area. This is uh, a figure that we will be looking at further into draft two, but we will be maintaining two buildings simultaneously, so we have to be prepared for that. We have also requested $27,000 for moving expenses. We estimate that we're going to have more than a thousand boxes of materials that have to work their way down the road. and other than if we want to form a grapevine and just pass it one to the other, I think we'll need some trucks. So um, we're going to fine tune that. I have some quotes coming in. Of course, we'll be looking for savings, but um, preliminarily we're asking for the 27,000. Moving into capital request for the new building. Of course, we're right in the midst of construction. We're requesting 7.8 million in the budget to continue with the construction. Approximately 5 million of that will be coming from debentures, the remainder from reserves. In our capital budget, of course, we're looking at fixtures, fittings, and equipment. Uh, there is approximately 1 million budgeted in that. We are about to release five RFP 
packages in February for different furnishings for the new building. Uh, staff, when we're evaluating those proposals, we'll of course be looking for savings as well. The new library, uh, we will be needing some new computers and office equipment. Uh, unfortunately, a number of the pieces of technology in our current library are a little past their best before date. We've been relying on refurbished items from Simcoe County IT for a number of years. So in, to ensure that uh, we're operating fully, we have requested 30,000 just to especially address some of the public use computers and the main service area computers. As well, uh, we're requesting an additional $7,000 for our collection budget. The library's collection has maintained uh, the same for a number of years because we have been forced to uh, maintain the same size of collection in our small building. We have not been able to grow the collection with the growth of the community and that's caused problems in that we are not meeting current industry guidelines for what we should be providing for a service. So the additional 7,000 will help us reach our projected growth of uh, more than 40,000 items in the collection. Starting in 2021, we put an emphasis on growing the collection. Unfortunately, it shows in our library, it's getting a little crowded in there as we pile books where we didn't have books previously. Uh, but we're working valiantly through procurement as well as donations in order to get up to a, a much better service level for our community. That wraps up library. I'm just going to quickly address a request for the Twin Pad Arena and Library fundraising campaign. We project a revenue of $1.175,000, which is not the same as one point anything million. Um, that revenue is confirmed revenue. It's based on contracts with our uh, sponsoring of the assets that have been sponsored in the new building. Um, we project that that is the base of what we're going to obtain through the coming year. Uh, we do have a number of assets that are still available, including a, a wonderful walking track, as well as a few uh, rooms in the library that can be sponsored by community businesses, organizations, or individuals who would like to be commemorated and support this new facility. So we predict that the revenue will be higher than the 175. As for expenses, in order to maintain this fundraising campaign, which is important, A, to potentially sell those assets, and B, to really get the community uh, interested in this project, which we predict a growing interest as they see the building continue to transform before their eyes, we're asking for approximately $25,000 just to maintain this fundraising project. 7,000 of it will be used for advertisements through publications, social media, and the radio. Uh, 8,000 approximate will be used to maintain the online platforms which are used for the donors, as well as the stewardship, videos, as well as banners. And then we requested $8,000 approximately to hold a grand opening donor recognition event when the doors open on this fantastic new facility. So that wraps up my budget. Thank you, Pam. Uh, questions or comments for Pam? Uh, I have one question, uh, I guess maybe for the treasurer. Uh, if you can go back one slide, please. So the library fund, uh, sorry, the new library construction, the library furnishings, uh, maybe I'm, I'm having a, a lapse in memory. But this has already been budgeted in the cost of the building, no? Through your worship, yes, yes, the the construction, that's the, the building, that's the cost for, that will incur in 23 for continuation of the building, and then in 23 we'll be buying the furnishings for the, the new building. So, so this is all part of that um, overall library arena budget that we have talked about in the past. Okay, so we're not asking for these funds again then? N no. We're just saying they're continue. there, it's what we're going to be using in 23. Yes, it's what we use in 23 because we have to build the 23 budget for what expenditures we in expect to incur in this year. Okay, so it's important then that we, we somehow clarify this for the general public because I think 
most people would look at this and think that we're now asking for another 37 or 38 million dollars when in fact it's already been budgeted this is not over a top of it's not we're going to go over budget this amount it's already there we're just allocating it to this year and what we can do is when we do our public presentation we'll make sure that this, there's maybe a, a slide even that covers that and will indicate as a footnote on these individual department slides that they're part of that larger budget and that would help clarify for everyone great thank you thank you all right seeing no other questions or comments thank you Pam and I think important to, to note though that uh, in our audience is uh, our new CEO of uh, the library board uh, here uh, staying involved and staying on top of things so welcome Lorraine uh, and we'll move on uh, to our next uh, victim well I'm sorry uh, Deputy Mayor Snell thank you if you could um, thank you, your worship did I see in, in one of the lines $60,000 being allocated for new books? Do you, do you recall that? Like, with the new library, obviously, it's a larger space, but I'm assuming that, you know, the inventory that you have now should be able to suffice. You're not looking to replace all of it, right? No. no. Through your worship, uh, the standard budget for the uh, library's collection every year is 53000 and that has been standard for a number of years now. And that what that it does is that enables, it doesn't go very far in all honesty, it enables us to about add about 2,000 items to the collection every year so that it's updated and refreshed. Um, the additional 7,000 is in order to help us grow it larger than standard. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Snell. Any other questions? All right, moving on. Thank you, Your Worship. So our next presenter is Chris Roos. He's our Director of Recreation, Events, and Facilities. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of Council, Deputy Mayor Snow. I've got about six slides. I don't have as nice a uh, wayfinding placemaker sign as Doug had, but we're going to end on a high note, I hope. Uh, <laughs> That's a bit of a joke, but we'll wait till I get to my last slide. <laughs> At any rate... By the uh, end of your last slide, it may very well be a bit of a joke. <laughs> you'll see, you'll see. <laughs> At any rate, uh, um, my first slide here is just an overview of uh, general administration uh, costs anticipated in our department. Uh, um, one of note is uh, staffing. Staffing is certainly a big part of uh, the recreation events and facilities department in the coming season and there's a number of uh, um, uh, both publicly uh, um, uh, uh, known uh, new uh, spending costs around facility and customer service as well as a, a number of adjustments that will be uh, talked about in closed session later. Uh, we also have uh, step and cola increases and pension benefits for part-time workers. So this is a new thing that's come along with OMERS, but it has a bigger impact on my department because we have a number of part-time people. Uh, about half of our 39 staff are part-timers. At any rate, uh, beyond that, a couple bigger steps uh, um, related to asset management software and uh, insurance increases. Obviously, our department looks after some of the larger buildings that the town takes care of, and uh, we took a big brunt of that uh, insurance increase this year. So moving on, uh, fairly status quo, the changes in uh, the special events uh, uh, spending, uh, uh, as many add-ons as take away. Uh, I did make an error, my first uh, number. So more or less, anything with brackets around it is lowering the levy. And anything without brackets or, uh, in it uh, in my uh, uh, presentation is uh, increasing the levy. But uh, that first note uh, talks about taking some money from reserves, $75,000. And uh, um, for some of you that may not have heard, uh, through the, the uh, couple years of COVID, we obviously drastically re uh, reduced special events. And uh, we set aside some money. And uh, this is the second year that we've drawn out of the reserves. Uh, to maintain uh, sort of back to normal programming with the special events department. So you see that $75,000 and it should have brackets around it uh, because it does lower the levy by using reserve monies. Beyond that, uh, brackets around the motorcycle event, you know that it's on the, um, 
the, the calendar and we're uh, working to try and have a motorcycle event, but we're not going to directly fund it. And uh, this is a change that uh, we've uh, implemented all uh, sponsorship that goes into uh, special event third party operators through a grant program and uh, um, th there will be monies there that we can uh, uh, direct out to a private organization, but it's not a, a, a direct uh, fund from the municipality to a private organization. So we've taken the money out of the actual base budget. Budget. Beyond that, uh, a number of the community events, uh, some increases and decreases, uh, Wasaga Sundays and patio music, uh, it has been eliminated from the special events department. There wasn't a lot of uptake, uh, but we put the money back into a number of our other uh, beachfront summertime events, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, changes to a few of the significant, uh, I like to call them statutory holidays, but uh, we try and do a regular every month, every other month uh, for the community. And uh, um, you can see those uh, events listed here from Canada Day. Hoot Nanny is a Thanksgiving event. Rock in the River is a summer event. Uh, that's a good news story because it's been very popular and we expect to increase our revenues there. Uh, beyond that, Snowman Mania. Uh, revenues it, it has been reduced because for the last few years we haven't collected any revenue I think the bracelets and the buttons kind of idea will come back but uh, we haven't gone indoors for a few years so we eliminated it from the budget for now but uh, um, ideally in this coming uh, month in February we'll see uh, uh, some revenues although we're not uh, uh, um, budgeting uh, uh, for the the big numbers that we've seen in the past Moving on into recreation, uh, similarly, uh, uh, brackets are a good news story. So uh, the first one is summer camp, and uh, um, it's been a couple years now that uh, the town has run summer camp, and uh, it, it was very successful. We actually had to come back to council and explain why we had so much revenue, and we asked for another staff person uh, mid-summer in 2022. Uh, we do have an increased uh, uh, plan there again with uh, staffing costs, uh, but the revenues uh, have been uh, projected more accurately and we still have a positive net in that uh, summer camp program that runs out of the youth center. Uh, beyond that, uh, removal of direct subsidies to organizations. Uh, and uh, this one sounds uh, drastic, but in fact, um, there were four organizations that had traditionally been part of the base budget and uh, the two largest subsidies that the town often or, or annually uh, supported were the figure skating and the minor hockey uh, associations. And uh, those numbers have been taken out of the recreation budget and reinstated through our fee structure. And we have a standing 21% discount for the local minor sports groups at our arena. And all the others have a minor sport rate, but the, uh, the impetus for this is that we wanted to incentivize uh, every single year uh, figure skating and minor hockey spent their subsidy and then continued on for another eight months. They, they were allowed to use it at a 50% of their invoice and they would usually drain it in two or three months and then the rest of the year they would pay the full minor sport rate. And now when we do a blanket 21%, the hope is that you know, if they hit a threshold at 11 months, now they can push on and rent as much ice as they feel is appropriate and the, the, the discount will continue. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's like running a, a used car lot and a, and a full uh, cost uh, car lot. The town will continue to garner some revenues and it will support our uh, two minor sport groups to grow their programs as large as they can imagine. Beyond that, uh, um, we have a, uh, um, a couple small uh, um, ups and downs in uh, Seniors Active Living Center. Uh, uh, we're training volunteers now, so we're, it's kind of a recognition piece, but uh, we're doing things like uh, first aid courses for uh, adults that are running programs for us. Um, and last but not least, uh, I've made mention to it here, and I have held this money as a placeholder in our admin budget, but uh, we have an inactive uh, youth advisory committee, and uh, there was a $1,900 expense for that under the youth center in the past. And uh, I'm not sure, I think that we're gonna have some visioning about what uh, type of uh, committees of council we may uh, have that apply to the Recreation Events and Facilities Department, but the money was taken out here, although put back into our admin budget. And moving on to capital, 
uh, a number of projects uh, that are up and coming. Uh, there's been a few discussions uh, already, but uh, as you know, $75,000 has been earmarked to study uh, the feasibility of all our recreation facilities, as well as uh, um, a condition assessment of the Wasaga Stars Arena specifically, and the intent is to uh, initiate that study uh, late in 2023 when we open the doors of the new facility. Um, Similarly, there are numbers here, uh, uh, like the discussion we had with the library. You can see the ongoing expense in 2023 for the uh, recreation portions of the new Twin Pat Arena and Library facility. You can see the electric ice resurfacer. <laughs> this is a, a carryover, in fact, from the 2022 budget. We know it takes more than a year to have these uh, custom machines built. We, we purchase an Olympia machine. We always say uh, Zamboni, and that's kind of like a Kleenex type of thing. And our ice resurfacer is actually a Olympia model. So we purchased that from a company out of Elmira. Um, beyond that, uh, there is one light duty van. This is an addition to the uh, facility fleet. We don't have many of those uh, actual fleet vehicles. We mostly use the surplus vehicles. Uh, but uh, we are uh, uh, allocating one new vehicle to the uh, larger staff team at the future uh, Twin Pad Library facility. And last but not least, uh, I've listed uh, the exact number for the recreation portion of furniture fixtures uh, and equipment budget that has been approved uh, within the larger Twin Pad Arena Library, so $912,000 for uh, uh, primarily uh, mechanical equipment, uh, uh, um, that's external from the building. So obviously, I, I always explain furniture, fixtures, and equipment is when we buy the building, the capital is all attached. If you turn the building upside down and shook it, everything that could fall out turns into the furniture, fixtures, and equipment uh, budget. And uh, beyond bookcases and uh, chairs and, and furnishings, uh, as we heard from the library uh, presentation, there are a number of things like a man lift, uh, um, a, a unit that can get us up into the light bulbs, uh, and outdoor snow equipment that we use for the sidewalks beyond the parking lots. Uh, at any rate, there's a significant number set aside there for uh, all of the extra pieces. There's a trapeze uh, uh, special uh, harness that uh, the figure skating uh, youth will use with their coaches, and, and that, that's a number that we uh, put into the furniture, fixtures, and equipment budget. And last but not least, uh, there are a number of smaller capital projects, uh, although uh, significant. Uh, the RecPlex uh, Phase two, let's say, after the old hall that people may remember by the baseball diamond, when the Lions Hall turned into the RecPlex officially in 2003, there are a, a series of new rooftop units, and uh, we lost half of the air conditioning ability in one of the largest units that, uh, there are two large units that uh, um, heat and cool the, the large gymnasium. And it's antiquated uh, um, equipment that uh, we're no longer allowed to um, replace with that type of refrigerant. It's, it's a banned refrigerant as of today. And uh, the refurbishment of that unit would be close to the replacement cost. And uh, because there, it requires a structural engineer and a significant uh, replacement uh, project, we've grouped both machines together. And uh, we intend to uh, work with consultants to uh, uh, upgrade those two uh, units. And we've budgeted $180,000 for those two uh, for the RecPlex Hall. And th that will get uh, um, a portion of the 2003 rooftop units replaced. Um, beyond that, uh, Hall 1 A and B sound system. Uh, we do have a system that dates to 2003 for the sound system as well, and uh, some of you re will remember that uh, about five years ago, we updated a number of the speakers in uh, uh, 2018, I believe it was, in both the Oakview uh, room and the large Hall 1A and B, but the actual operating system is uh, continuing to uh, um, short in and out, and it's pretty critical. We use it on a daily basis. This system is designed uh, in a large assembly to give uh, sound to uh, the entire hall, but at other times it separates the YMCA from the other uh, the, the the hall with the stage, and it's tied into a significant system of microphones, et cetera, that we use during theater productions, et cetera. 
but uh, staff has uh, um, done some preliminary pricing and, it, and it's uh, certainly a significant cost, $40,000, but the system that we would like to put into the RecPlex, it mirrors exactly what we're uh, having designed and we've learned a little bit from the design in the new twin pad library. They also have these pairing systems uh, in our uh, multi-purpose room that has a divider wall the same as the RecPlex, and uh, we would like to upgrade and, in fact, ideally learn how to operate that uh, uh, today's technology. It's all modern. It's, it's about a tenth of the size of what we own today, but that new uh, um, audio system ideally will be in place at the RecPlex before we get to the Twin Pad Library, where, where we'll have five new systems similarly throughout that entire building. And. Uh, Last but not least, uh, I speak to some signage uh, plans and I put that under uh, the signage at the RecPlex, but it's also a bit of a change slide and so uh, draft one sometimes updates. Oh, no, sorry, there's a couple more capitals. We don't get to see the last slide yet. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So a couple more small co capital projects that are up and coming. Uh, HVAC at the U Center. So uh, that building is also somewhat dated. We have three separate air conditioners and three separate furnaces. furnaces. And uh, for, for any of you that have been to the Youth Center, uh, when the Seniors Active Living Center holds the Super Wednesdays, I think that's one of our more popular events recently. But if you get 50 people in that building all at the same time, the windows are dripping, and that's because we have more of a household furnace and it's not set up proper, but uh, uh, we'd like to have air exchange built into that. We did that out in the garage. Uh, uh, for those of you who haven't visited the youth center recently, we do uh, have a fully renovated garage with a proper bathroom out there, and uh, it was always a bit dank. It, it had this uh, um, electric baseboard system before, and now we have an air handling system there, and it's improved it quite a bit, and, and the hopes are to do that properly in the main building, so there's money set aside for that. Uh, as well, uh, there's a carryover. Uh, we have been doing a landscape project that uh, Council can anticipate uh, coming uh, probably before the end of winter, um, and uh, those payments will be for landscape uh, design of the exterior of the building. Uh, special Events has small plans for uh, uh, garbage cans and recycling bins, uh, more to our stock uh, as we often have lost them over the years. And uh, last but not least, the facility department looks after some uh, uh, capital upgrades at Town Hall. And two key ones that I wanted to list that uh, are, are not the biggies. I know we heard about the elevator and I think there's uh, some other funded uh, projects for washrooms as well in the uh, Town Hall facility, but uh, uh, there's window replacements and blinds, $25,000. And uh, 404 Mosley building, uh, we have a, a quote to upgrade all of the lighting so that it's automated uh, with motion sensors inside and out, uh, just to make that facility a little bit more safe. 404 Mosley is a uh, house that was purchased by the town uh, by about 12th Street. Uh, uh, oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, we had two houses that were uh, purchased for daylighting and uh, um, after the road was widened, uh, um, the town still owns one of them and uh, we have it set up for storage right now and it doesn't have proper lighting. And on to the last slide, um, signage. <laughs> so uh, for, for any of you who have driven by, um, I, I know the date of this sign. It was 2006 when we opened uh, the YMCA in the second half of the RecPlex facility. But uh, unfortunately, that huge windstorm when we had to shut down the town offices on the Friday before uh, the holidays on December 23rd, uh, the, uh, the plexiglass broke on this sign. But uh, it has been earmarked in the past. And uh, obviously, we'll wait to ensure that the branding exercise is 100% complete. But uh, uh, my intent with the uh, money that was fully earmarked for the RecPlex and, in fact, the roadside pylon that has digital uh, reader boards, uh, highly pixelated, the red and black. Um, although I feel like some of the look and feel of all of our uh, town facilities could take the upgrade now and we'll look at the digital uh, reader board in the future as it is still working. So I split up that money a little bit uh, between not only the RecPlex uh, uh, main building and roadside, but uh, also the two large vans. We thought that we would put a wrap on them, something special, so that it, uh, we, we parked them out front under the camera at, the, at both of our uh, facilities, and, and we thought it would help as a, a sort of a, a, a good look and feel for the facility. And beyond that, uh, the youth center uh, and Sulk uh, 
um, San, uh, signage out front. There's a reader board there. And the Wasaga Stars Arena, that road sign has been broken for uh, uh, five years, I think, uh, now. And uh, we were waiting on the new branding, and uh, it, it has a hole in it. Uh, it's not as bad as the picture that I've given you here today, but I, I do feel like a signage upgrade uh, is warranted uh, across all of the recreation buildings. And that, uh, uh, Your Worship and Council, is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Director Ruse, uh, Rose. Sorry, Any questions or comments, Councillor Blanchet. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just uh, uh, two things: a clarification on the increase in seventy-six thousand dollars in insurance, and I know insurance is going uh, up significantly through all areas of our organization. Uh, related to the new build, like uh, is the uh, contractor responsible so like uh, we we won't have that handed over to the town until probably late 2023 so i'm assuming this $76,000 increase is on existing facilities uh, uh through your worship uh, to councilor blanche there is a forty thousand uh, dollar chunk of that uh, uh, insurance which we didn't pay in the past committed to the uh, uh, twin pad arena library but uh, um, beyond that i'd have to look to the treasurer if there are specifics about the uh, um, annualization of that insurance number for the larger building Through your worship um, so we're actually just still getting uh, confirmation from the we're still getting confirmation from the insurance company of what the uh, full insurance cost is going to be for the new building um, there may be some estimate of the insurance in this number here Mo the majority of the number you're seeing here though is related to existing buildings <clears throat> so just a follow-up then is uh, on, a, on a larger picture, I've, I've heard a lot of numbers uh, bantered about related to the total existing operation costs of our library and double fat arena currently, so with nothing related to the new build, and then what our operation cost is projected to be uh, on a full year of operation once we open. Uh, I'm wondering if if we could have, uh, not that today, but the next time on the next budget update, if we could just have an accurate picture of those two numbers. Councilor Belanger, Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> under the um, events, the event summary tab that you had, I didn't see the end of summer, the end of summer event. Is that still staying on there? Definitely me uh, memories of summer. I, I could look back to the main, I, I may not have listed it, and likely uh, the, uh, the net on that uh, uh, program area hasn't changed, but uh, definitely memories of summer is still in here, uh, uh, and it isn't expected to be a change. Just looking quickly. Yeah, $20,000 is committed there, uh, fireworks and uh, an entertainment show, uh, certainly always on the uh, Labor Day weekend. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very popular event. Um, uh, in regards to some of the um, investments that you're doing for sound equipment, if I could suggest to consider um, outdoor speakers for the outdoor events and a microphone. Um, only I, I heard feedback from folks uh, standing around me at the Remembrance Day event, as well as the tree lighting ceremony, that the, the sound when, when the mayor was, was um, speaking wasn't clear and uh, there was, it was cutting in and out on the speaker. So I think to show, throw some dollars there makes a lot of sense with how many outdoor events your team does. And the other thing I'd, I'd love for your team to consider in your signage is to put a, a good size billboard on the property at the Recplex, maybe by the gazebo, that promotes that the market happens on a weekly basis and then listing a summary of, of the events for the summer. I think that's such a great high traffic area, not only from vehicle traffic, but um, all the families going there for programming. And then of course you've got the, you know, the, the group population that come um, to the market in music each week. And the other thought I would have is the sports park. There's a kiosk that's out there um, that's, that's not utilized at all. It's like a little triangular unit or a square unit, I can't remember. And it sits right in the center of the three diamonds 
and I was there for my um, nephew's uh, playing ball last summer, and I was amazed. There was over 100 people there at one particular moment, and so I think it's a great opportunity where it wouldn't need infrastructure. It would just need a core plast um, events list there. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Snell. Uh, Councillor White. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Actually, my comment was uh, outdoor audio at the uh, Rackplex. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor White. Councillor Ego. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> yes, um, Hootenanny, I'm not that familiar with it. I do realize it's a Thanksgiving event. If you could just give a little explanation on it. I see you're asking for funds for that, but decreasing on the snowman mania. Am I correct? I think the revenue has gone down for snowman mania, so that was uh, an increase in the net cost of the snowman mania event. Uh, as far as the uh, Hootenanny, uh, it, it's always taken place on Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, some time ago, we learned that uh, um, tourism, tourism often happens regardless over the 10 weeks of summer and to, to push out into the shoulders. And Hootenanny started uh, probably about four years ago now. And uh, it's sort of like a fall festival afternoon. It's, it's never more than half a day. But uh, country is typically our theme, and there's a uh, uh, corn roast type of thing, and uh, uh, lots of hay bales and hay rides uh, for the kids uh, around the Recplex property. And uh, um, it's always been, I believe, on the Saturday afternoon of Thanksgiving. Okay, thanks. So it's a half a day event. Okay. That's right. Thanks. Yes. Supplementary, go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. On. Um, Oh, there's one other thing. Well, I have you on your uh, operating budget here. It caught my eye, and it's called, and it's under you, a medical facility. And perhaps I was speaking with Jocelyn the other day, and she she might have had an opportunity to ask you about it. And it's the expenditure is like was budgeted for three thousand, so twenty three hundred. So I don't know what a medical facility. <laughs> I'm curious. Certainly, I, I was aware of your uh, question, Councillor uh, Ego, and th through you, uh, Mayor Smith. Uh, the, the medical facility is, is roughly a third of 1620 Mosley, the youth centre building. Um, if if councillors are not aware, um, it, it, the, the discussion on this one has been fairly low key, although in recent discussions with the hospital, um, they are no longer concerned about us keeping it quiet. But uh, uh, there are a number of uh, mental health uh, 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 appointment rooms in there, and uh, the town has always uh, given that to the Collingwood General Marine Hospital, uh, where uh, th three therapists can work uh, Monday to Friday. And it, it's typically a daytime use thing for the hospital, but uh, the intent was always that uh, if someone needed to do uh, two sessions or 20 sessions with a therapist and they lived in Wasaga Beach, that they could uh, save themselves the drive. There's also an outpatient area at the uh, actual hospital that you see on Hume Street in Collingwood. But uh, the town leases that uh, to the hospital for a dollar. And uh, I think uh, based on the advice from our auditors, we split up the costs of our building and we put some of it to the youth center, we put some of it to the seniors programming, and we put a portion, I believe it's 10%, to uh, th this third at the end that uh, isn't used by the town, although we maintain it. And uh, these are the costs that we use to maintain that facility. Thank you, I'm a little wiser, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Timms? I, I have a question about a, a um, uh, signed uh, information centre in Oakwood Park that is uh, just uh, west of the gazebo that's in very bad shape, quite dilapidated, and I, I wonder if there's any thought on uh, uh, updating that part of a beautification program. I, I can attempt to respond to that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is it the stone? Yeah, so there's been some ongoing discussion in terms of uh, that used to be actively managed through the Recreation Department, and in, in recent years, uh, we haven't leveraged that for any announcements or notices, and, and in fact, the wall, the structural integrity of the uh, structure itself is, is deteriorating to a point where 
Uh, there has been some discussion to have it removed, um, but I think uh, that was our priority and preference, but um, we still have to have those discussions uh, internally, uh, but it definitely uh, requires attention, uh, Councillor Timms, and it's on our list of things to uh, evaluate. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Timms. Any other questions or comments? All right, could you go back one slide for me, please? Uh, one more. So the uh, Hall A and B rooftop units are replacement of 160K, and this includes consulting fees. Can you break out for us how much of this is consulting fees versus the actual equipment? I can't do that yet. Uh, the one investigation that I have gone through is the structural. So uh, um, there are building requirements if we change the, the drip edge of our uh, future machine. And uh, it has to do with snow load. Uh, and so we are aware that we are not able to change the drip edge of our uh, current machines. But if we do, we're going to require a structural review and probably a more detailed design to ensure that the roof can take the load of the new, more modern machines. If we do a like-for-like -like swap, uh, the, the current design has changed and it's larger than the one that's there that does the same BTU and pounds of cooling. So uh, it's almost certain. Uh, but all we were able to ascertain uh, leading into this budget is that we um, definitely do not have the structural requirement to expand on the drip edge of our uh, existing machines, uh, Mayor Smith. So I'm sorry, I can't give you the exact number, but uh, um, like for like, uh, plus about 30% is where we came up with that budget number. I think that's a great explanation. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, the next item I have is 404 Mosley. My understanding is that this this home or building will, uh, when the widening of, uh, of Mosley comes to be, will probably be torn down because we're going to need that, that uh, space for the road. So if that is correct, I, I suggest we don't spend any money. And if we're only using this building for storage, what kind of special lighting do we need for storage? I, I certainly can't speak to the longevity of the building and the road widening. I was actually under the understanding that uh, Mosley was upgraded and the, 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 those works are complete, but I'll, I'll defer to uh, uh, the Public Works Director afterwards. Uh, as far as the lighting goes, uh, we don't have any lighting there, and the idea is that uh, if we can uh, um, use that one safely into the evenings, that there would be automatic lighting come on. Uh, uh, there's been, if you drive by, you'll see there's two buildings. One is a bunkie that has a garage and uh, a flat roof, and uh, uh, we've maintained the building just so that it's not falling down. And uh, the last thing was the uh, uh, lighting, and uh, we uh, intended to put it in the budget so that it was actually an approved expense. Uh, the, the roof repairs that were done and uh, the cleanup of the building actually happened uh, uh, in 2022, and this was the final step. All right, thank you, Kevin. Did you have anything to add? I'm going. I'm through, you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm going on memory here, but I, I don't. I'm not aware if it was acquired through tax sale. But um, when it became uh, under ownership of the town, we had requested that we acquire the first three meters of its frontage as well as the daylighting before the town considers its dip disposition. Um, so. Um, so the, the, the road of widening has been dedicated uh, accordingly, but the actual improvements, no, there, there have been no improvements. Um, the, the paved shoulder um, encroaches within that road widening, but uh, that section of Mosley Street uh, hasn't gone through an environmental assessment, and it's, it's a long-term plan for, for its improvements. All right, so uh, the history there, I believe that property was donated to the town from the estate of Mrs. Corbett. Uh, when she passed, and, and uh, I know that it was uh, purchased at the same time or roughly the same time as the other property on the opposite corner, so on the northeast or west corner, uh, which has been sold. So if there's no longer any need for this property uh, and it's not uh, an issue where we're going to require more uh, of the land uh, due to widening or so on, I'm, I'm not sure we shouldn't be considering deeming it surplus and bring some of those funds into uh, the budget to cover off on some other things. 
Um, and then my last item is with respect to the sound system for Hall A and B, uh, I have absolutely no issue um, spending funds on a, a good sound system for Hall A and B. It's been, um, I've been involved in the, in the town for going on 10, eight years now, nine years. And uh, from day one when I was mayor in 2014, prior to that, I cannot tell you how many complaints I have gotten over the sound system and how poor it is in this building. So um, I have no issue uh, supporting um, the funding for that. Uh, my only recommendation is if we're going to put a new sound system in, and, I, I'm, and I'm not saying you haven't, uh, Chris, but I hope that we've done a thorough um, uh, analysis of this and that we're putting in the best possible sound system we can for the acoustics in that building because that's the problem. So, and if that means we need another five or ten thousand dollars to make sure it's right this time, uh, I recall when we put the new speakers in in '18 and it was a slight improvement. We thought it was going to be the end all be all, and in fact, it wasn't. So important for that building because it is used so often uh, for many functions that that sound system be um, pretty darn good. And so uh, I, I think that's a great idea. Uh, no other questions or comments. Moving on to the next. Oh, sorry, Chris. I, I just might add one more thing, uh, Mayor Smith, that, that uh, I, I didn't comment previously, but there is a tenant that lives in that 404 building as well. Uh, so, so it's technically three units. One is the garage that uh, we're talking about the majority of this lighting project, and then there's an upstairs and a downstairs to the Corbett house, and the upstairs has an apartment in it, and it is rented out uh, by the town. Thank you. All right, moving on, Madam Treasurer. Thank you, Your Worship. We're about probably 85% of the way through the presentation. Do we need a break at this time? Sorry, did you say 5%? No, 85, 80. <laughs> <laughs> better, you better get that bylaw back for 10 o'clock, Madam Clerk. <laughs> uh, anybody need a break? Yeah, I'm seeing some head nods. So let's take a 10 minute break. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you.
Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll call this meeting back to order. And I will uh, look to our treasurer to move on to the next uh, victim on the list. Thank you, Your Worship. So um, for the next few slides, I'm going to do the presentation for draft one and um, because I was more involved at the time when we put these particular budgets together. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the council, administration, and policing and beachfront budgets. So for council, um, the operating budget in total for council expenses is 948,000 for 23. And the budget covers expenses associated with council member, members' re remuneration and a portion of the executive assistance wages and other administrative expenditures. Um, specific activities for council includes their membership in AMO and uh, participation in the ROM conference as well as the AMO annual AGM conference. As this is a new term of council, we have the placeholder of 550,000 um, that's included in the budget for the corporate priorities. As you work through and establish those pri priorities, we will again reallocate that, that funding to its proper, or expenditure to its proper budget. The capital budget has a few small items that are part of the regular life cycle requirements for computers and regular furniture requirements. And then on the um, administrative and, and um, under the admin budget, we also have the grant and casino transfers. So that's why I've labeled it that way so you can understand those are sort of large amounts that transfer through this administration budget. Now also at this time, um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit more about staffing at the very end of the presentations. But I do have one staffing item that I need to, need to walk on at this time that uh, just came up recently. And um, we have one uh, new position that needs to be approved so that the recruitment process could be, begun, be started right away. And that is a Director of Communications and Intergovernmental Affairs. And the position has a, a change in the cost from the communications position that is in the budget right now. So presently we have a, a communications position, but because we're changing that position to a different, um, we're changing the job description and, 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 and a rate change as well. So that has a $46,000 financial impact that we will have to um, in, incur if we proceed with that position, which we need to do. Normally these staffing positions all would get approved through the regular budget process, but we have a timing um, a matter here that we need to address now. So at this point, I'd like to just turn it over to our CAO and let him explain the need for this position and the, and the cha challenges we have with it. Thank you, Jocelyn. Mr. CAO? Yeah, th thank you, Jocelyn. And through the mayor to mem members of council, um, we have had, or the town has had a communications officer for many, many years. Um, what we are looking to do is expand the scope of that position beyond just communications, meaning issuing press releases and monitoring Facebook, that type of, of activity that has gone on here for, for the past, uh, past while. Um, what we would like to do is bring in a director of communications and intergovernmental affairs. Um, the governmental side of this is quite important. And as I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, reestablishing those connections with the province and the, uh, the provincial and federal governments, that requires significant engagement and a significant amount of time. You have to work those relationships with the various ministers um, that are relevant to Wasaga Beach, both at a provincial and federal level. As well, you need to be monitoring actions of other levels of government as they impact this community. As we've talked about uh, quite a bit today, uh, the impact of the bills coming out of the province are significant on the economics of this community. So having an individual who is really responsible for uh, not only the day-to-day -day communications, but uh, working at that level, we think is absolutely critical uh, to the future success uh, of this community. So that, that's a high level uh, of, of what we're thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, or I'm sorry, Andrew, uh, Jocelyn. 
Okay, so now with, with that, um, we will seek direction towards the end of the meeting on that matter. And um, also, I'll just continue now with the administration budget and then we'll get to the rest of the staffing at the end. So for administration, we, ha we have the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund grant, and this grant is received through by many municipalities throughout Ontario, and a few years ago, the province um, started to reduce this grant, and they're reducing it by 15% each year. And so the amount of um, that, that our grant has been reduced in 2023 is $200,000, which is quite significant for us because we use this grant to fund 75% of it, it goes towards our capital replacement reserve and that helps with our asset management requirements. And the other 25% supports our operating costs. So as that 25% grant funding is reduced, our co operating costs in taxation increase. And you saw earlier I mentioned the $49,000 increase. So, um, we contribute 832,000 of that total grant is what's going to our capital asset replacement reserve. And the administration budget also covers a wide variety of corporate expenses and programs. And so our HR staffing requirements are, all, are flowed through this budget. And there's a small increase in our wage and benefits in this budget um, for increased hours for the HR assistant. So we've added um, a small amount of wage and benefits for that purpose. The total wage and benefits costs that are in this budget are one million uh, of the total budget. And the insurance costs, building maintenance for the town, utilities, and some of the cleaning costs for our town hall here, they also flow through this budget. So those admin administrative expenses, um, including the staffing costs, are 1.5 million. And some of the program-related costs cover the doctor rec recruitment program, so you can see there's 35,000 there. We have the grants to organizations program and the food bank donation, and though that's about 63,000. We do the street manners for the town and our community engagement uh, uh, website and the conservation authority um, costs also flow through this budget. Another item that we uh, bring in through revenue and transfer out to reserves is the casino revenue. And so as a ballpark estimate, not knowing what we're going to be receiving, I've used the 800,000 as just a, a starting point based on some research that I did into what uh, this size of casino I think might earn. But we'll know better when we get to the end of the year on that one. So in the capital budget, we have the new elevator that we've talked about. So we have 380,000 for that. We're very happy to say we just received the news this week that we got the $100,000 grant for this project. And uh, um, that was very good news to, to have that come through. And we also have um, the washrooms and some other renovations and earlier, um, it was mentioned that the washrooms, we need to make them more accessible, so we have some renovation work to do there. And some of that cost, again, it's the town hall building, so it goes through this budget. We also have uh, the grant money that we receive for federal gas tax, so that's about $655,000 a year. And we put $250,000, our 1% capital levy, that we contribute to our capital replacement reserve as well for asset management. So those reserves come through the capital budget and are transferred. For the police budget, uh, that is a $5.2 million cost, and this year the increase was about 4.2%. We received some revenues through this budget, 110,000 for POA fines, and we also this year um, pulled in 63,000 from the police reserve to, just to help um, smooth some of the increased costs for this budget. So I'll talk now about the beachfront 
budget, and this one in, uh, has two main items that are flowing through it. It's the beachfront rental property, so our commercial leases that we have uh, down at the beachfront, and then our beachfront redevelopment. And there are some costs that we need to incur for the beachfront redevelopment as we're planning for it. There are studies, um, there, are some, some, there are some work sometimes that have to be done. So we have a small amount in that budget that's set aside and we've put those costs through the beachfront redevelopment line. So if we look at the operating budget for uh, the beachfront, you can see that we have the rental properties. Uh, and the leases are currently being signed um, over the next uh, coming month or so, or next few weeks. And so we have $405,000 in the budget. You can see it's very similar to what we had in 2022. Um, we also have other revenue sources coming from parking lot rentals and cost recovery amounts for utilities and property taxes. The property tax recovery for 23 but budget is 39,000 higher than 22 levels. The total revenues for the budget are 569,000 and that's about 45,000 more than 22. In the costs to operate the commercial properties, we have 615,000 and that includes, we have staffing costs of 164,000, property taxes of 170, utilities 54, and uh, janitorial services, 128,000, and then 99,000 for other remaining expenses. So there's about $615,000 of costs, um, which is a little bit higher than in 22. Um, also, I'd like to just point out right now, we've captured this under the janitorial services line for the washrooms, whether or not we add more part-time staff or outsource the, the um, services for the washrooms for the beachfront, that hasn't been quite decided yet, so we've just put it as a placeholder. So that's why you see a large increase in that line item if you were comparing it to 2022. So the net tax supported increase for this budget is $14,000. So for the capital budget and some of the draft two items, um, we have the council priorities, and then we have Festival Square. So we've got 200,000 in the budget presently for design of Festival Square for the beachfront. And at the time when we put that in, we also had $100,000 in um, revenue coming from the developer when we were last working with the, the um, development master plan with the, with the prior vendors. So that will be removed in draft two, $100,000 of it. So we'll probably have to pull from reserve to cover that extra 100,000 because we need 200,000 in this budget for, to begin the design work. So I, I'm going to move on to Treasury and IT, but I just wondered if there's any questions before I do. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was having a Joe Belanger moment. <laughs> <laughs> Questions or comments so far? Deputy Mayor Snell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, for the 380000 um, for the elevator, and you mentioned about getting the grant, congratulations on that. Uh, is that three eighty including the $100,000 grant? Through Your Worship. Yes, okay. And a second question, if I could? Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, you answered, yes. Um, the um, under the policing expenses, have any of the H2OI events um, come through as far as um, the expenses for for dealing with those particular events? I, I believe we're seeing some of it in 23 because we did have a bit of a larger increase in some of the overtime costs. So I, I think it's it started. They had said that it would come through in 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 over the a couple of years and they said 23 is when you might start to see it. So I did notice that, so I believe you can't, you don't really get it um, broken out like that, but just looking at the overtime cost and the increase that I saw made me think that that's what it was uh, related to. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Snell. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Belanger. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I just have a, a question and, a, you know, this would be more, uh, for some of the staff that were here at the time, but uh, I, I had questioned uh, the demolition of 
some of the buildings on the beachfront and the timing of that based on when we could projectedly get shovels into the ground. And I'm looking at uh, $120,000 shortfall between revenue and expense on your previous slide. And, you know, had we maintained those uh, buildings uh, for another season, some of them, uh, frankly, were some of the newest construction, the, the Tim Hortons and Beaver Tails and, and those buildings, uh, you know, we, we probably would have had a balanced uh, budget uh, in that area. So I, I don't know if I ever did really get a good answer on that, but it was my understanding is that we were two years away from shovels in the ground, um, yet we uh, did the demolition early. So anyhow, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone want to take a stab at that uh, and answer that question? or? No? Okay. Thank Moving you. on. Uh, any other questions or comments from Council? Seeing none, Madam Treasurer. Thank you, Your Worship. I was just going to say I will look into that change, but I, I don't think it would have covered that cost fully, but I will come back with an answer on that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's move on now to Treasury and IT. So in the Treasury Department, we provide front counter customer service in public, uh, to the public and support by phone for about 12,000 tax and water sewer accounts and residents and customer accounts. Our front counter service also provides information for visitors and tourists. And Treasury act activities include investing available funds into long and short term investments as per the investment policy to earn interest. Uh, we do the collection of water and tax amounts that are owing, and including penalties and interest. And staff maintain all financial systems and recon reconciliations to support the annual audit of the town's financial statements. Overall, the revenues are greater, than, are greater at $1.9 million than the expenses for Treasury of $1.6 million. And I apologize, I didn't move forward on the slide. So... Uh, the revenues are 1.9, our expenses are 1.6, so we have a surplus of 316,000, and that is used to support uh, lowering the taxation in the current year. And you can see on the slide some of the different types of costs that we have. I know postage might seem odd here, but it's a fairly big expense for when you have that many accounts that you're mailing out water bills every other month and tax bills uh, a couple of times a year. So for draft two, um, we are evaluating a software product that may improve the efficiency processing of accounts payable and allow for remote processing of invoices. So we're just looking at that to see whether there's a, uh, the cost-benefit analysis works. And um, if this allowed for remote processing of invoices, probably then I would use the um, COVID grant monies to cover the cost of the software. But at this time, we're still assessing whether or not it's a a viable um, option to consider, but it's one way of maybe uh, having efficiency gains too for us in the department. Um, we do have a staffing request in this budget and it's for a permanent full-time asset management clerk the, with a se September start date. So for 23, the cost would be 27,000 and on an annualized basis, that cost would be 82,000. And this is, um, we require this position because of the new regulation of the asset management um, uh, regulation where we have to, there's financial planning that we have to do, there's um, asset management of the assets themselves that we have to do, so we have this new software that we're implementing, and those, um, the new software and those new requirements to uh, do the financial planning are going to add some uh, work to not only the Treasury Department, but likely other departments as well. So um, the asset management group that's looking at this, the team uh, is recognizes this position, will probably help support the asset management requires of other departments as well, not just the Treasury Department. So we've placed it here for now, and we'll, uh, um, as we move through rolling out the new software 
and we get closer to the fourth quarter of the year, we'll be able to better assess the actual job description for this, but we recognize there's likely a, um, a resource required in order to maintain and, and keep up with the requirements. And then um, that that's, concludes for the, the Treasury. So before I move on to IT, are there any questions on the Treasury Department? Councillor Delay. Can you just explain, you had on one of your slides credit card payments. You want to explain that, please? Thank you. Great question. I like this one. So we have, um, for years, we have taken uh, credit card payments at the um, front counter. And I, I don't know if anyone is familiar, but um, while it's not uh, illegal in, in Ontario to charge a surcharge, um, MasterCard and Visa would not let you charge that surcharge. So in your agreements with them, you could not charge if the card was present. And um, so the town wanted to take credit card payments, um, and that was taken, I, I think, started probably eight, ten years ago. And so the town had to absorb that fee, and generally that fee cost us around $100,000 approximately. Um, it, that's where it had been... A, close to. And then when COVID came, we needed to actually increase our credit card payment intake even further to help uh, deal with trying to keep um, uh, people not coming into the building but still be able to, to make payments on their account. So just as an interim measure for COVID, we added in um, telephone payments with credit cards. Now you actually, when you get a machine to take the, the process those payments on, it doesn't come programmed with that because um, there's risk. And if the person makes the payment and then turns around and disputes it, it's automatically the town's cost no matter what on that because the card was not present. So there's more risk to the town to take a telephone payment. Not only that, it increased our telephone calls substantially to the point where our system, we were having trouble flowing calls through our system. And it increased that credit card charge, which is now running closer to $140,000, $150,000 for the um, credit card charge in, in around there. So um, we're now looking at COVID is pretty much um, not impacting us in the same way. And we're moving, we moved a lot more online payments to our websites and to portals that we have available. So we're going to be looking at removing the telephone um, uh, payments starting in February because of the resources it's taking, the risk that it's adding, um, and we've got new payment methods that will accommodate um, those remote type payments. So it won't be necessary. However, the credit card payments at the front counter still were absorbing those costs. So thank you for your question because I really wanted to talk about that and, and it is incurring a cost for us, but we do, um, we'll still continue to have some, some credit card payments significantly around the 100, 110 mark. Councillor Delia. I totally understand that because usually per payment it's between 1.4 and 2% that is added on to our costs. So that totally makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank You're you, welcome. Councillor. Councillor White. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, however, there is some new legislation that does allow us to charge these fees now. Is, so is this something that we can do to recover that hundred and some odd thousand? Through Your Worship, yes. So that was just recently, around October, when that, um, then when that uh, went through. So now the credit card companies can't stop us anymore. We could add a surcharge, and I think the max is 2% that we could add. Um, to anyone um, paying by credit card. And, the, and that is something that um, I can bring forward at a later date to discuss, it. do we want to consider that? Because um, there's, there's always pros and cons about that when you add that surcharge. So we can have those conversations later if you'd like me to bring something back on that topic. Right, thank you. Would you like, would you like that, Councillor? Something you can back? So, Madam Clerk, do we need uh, a resolution or a direction or... This is to bring a report forward on the uh, credit card uh, service charges. Thank you, Worship. Um, if we are going to seek direction from the uh, treasurer to do that, then yes, if someone wants to put forward a motion. All right, so and two-thirds for that or no? 
Uh, well, if so, we're not adding it to the agenda. We're making a request, right? Correct. Okay. So if we just want to, put, someone wants to um, put forward a motion and get a seconder, and then we'll vote on. Do you have a seconder, Councillor White, for that? All right. So uh, moved by Councillor White, seconded by Deputy Mayor Snell, that a report come forward from Treasury with respect to service charges for uh, credit card payments. All right. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. All in favor? Carries unanimously. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Thank you. Okay, and um, I'm going to just mention now about the debentures. I'll just this chart just um, is similar to what you saw earlier. So our our forecasted debentures at the end of 23 are 43.7 million, and the carrying costs are 2.3 million. So moving now to IT. So the, t the IT budget provides support for several crit critical items. Um, user support is provided daily for application programs and network-related requests. Technicians look after the back-of-house networks, physical and network security, and communication systems. And website management is provided for the town's corporate site. The total operating cost for IT support is 759000 of which 488000 uh, represents staffing costs and 160,000 represents outside services for managed computer services. The 23 budget includes a request for a temporary full-time computer support specialist five-month contract, adding an additional staffing cost of 10,200, which represents 50% of this cost of this five-month contract. This is a shared position with the library that is needed to support the launch and implementation of IT services in the new TPAL building, uh, Twin Pad Library building. And we have one other staffing request um, that is part of the closed session discussions, which I'll mention later. So is there any questions on the IT budget? Questions or comments from Kathy? Seeing none, carry on. Okay. So at this time, I'm now going to pass the presentation over to uh, Rachel Ivek, and she's going to present the Municipal Enforcement and Parking. My apologies. I'm going to pass it over to Laura Borland to look after Clerk Cemetery and Archives. Thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you, Mayor Smith, members of Council. Uh, so we will jump into the clerk's uh, cemetery archives budget. Um, notable highlights in the clerk's operating budget include staffing, which um, is 77% of the overall budget and is actually 7,000 less than 2022, and in does include all annual COLA and STEP increases. Uh, we are looking for um, the reintroduction of a records management summer student for operational needs for at 15,000. Um, and if we want to move on to our archives, uh, notable, oh, you can go back, sorry, it's still on the same, sorry, sorry, the archives operating budget, uh, notable highlights there include the archives coordinator position, which was added in 2022, and there's an annualization cost of $11,000 for this year. Um, notable highlights for the cemetery operating budget include a land survey pinning, which will be an operating expend expenditure of 8000 and if we want to go to the next slide, our capital projects um, for 2023, we can see a new columbarium to be installed in the cemetery at 36,000 um, from reserves. Uh, within our accessibility advisory committee, we have a signed program initiative uh, for $5,000. Uh, that will cover the installation of communication boards at all town playgrounds for assistance to nonverbal individuals. Um, this was an initiative brought by the committee last uh, last year. Also, the Moby Mat extensions, which are um, we're looking for winged pieces to come off the existing uh, Moby mats down at the beachfront, and that's five thousand dollars from reserves carried forward from uh, last year's budget. We're also looking at a staff computer upgrade for uh, fifteen hundred dollars. And if we go to our last slide, our proposed draft two. Uh, we're looking for records management, software, license transfer reserves. Um, we're looking to defer the $60,000 amount, so that would be deferred to 2024. And we're also looking um, at the Historical Advisory Committee interpretive panel sign removal of $3,000 for that project. But we are looking to add the accessible live action box, box cast oversight at 2500 and that is to um, increase 
our accessible requirements for our meetings uh, when they are recorded. This provides the closed captioning, so this is an element that will be um, obligated to provide under the ADA, AODA by 2025, so we are looking to get that rolling now. Um, Rachel is here for the bylaw component, but if there are any questions of the clerks at this time, I'm happy to address those. Members of Council, Councillor Timms. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a thought that I have from time to time is about the archives. We have a staff member who works there alone unless a member of the volunteer community will be in with her. And I wondered from a risk management perspective if that's a good practice for us. Thank you, Councillor Timms. Um, this is something that the staff have reviewed under our risk uh, management assessment. Uh, typically, the staff member that works there does only try to come in, I believe, an hour's where it, when it is staffed with volunteers. Am I correct in that? For the most part, yes. There are there are times um, where sh uh, that member is is there alone, but it is something that staff are reviewing as part of the risk assessment. So, if no volunteer is available, the archive will close. Uh, not necessarily, no. Um, uh, this individual does check in with us to let us know the days that they are not with a member, but we do try to line them up with volunteers so that there um, isn't an opportunity for them to be alone. I would just suggest, Your Worship, um, Madam Clerk, that uh, that's a, a risky practice to have someone alone working in a building. Um, quite isolating, even though it is on Main Street, it can still be quite isolating. So that is kind of a worrisome piece for me. Thank you, Councillor Timms. Other questions? Councillor Belanger? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Just, uh, just a question on uh, revenues. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see a revenue line here, but uh, for instance, on the columbarium, uh, that the, the new one, I, I, I'm assuming that uh, once they are u utilized by our residents, that, that that would more than cover the cost of the, the unit. And I know on you know some of the services uh, that you that are performed, I believe there there is revenue involved. Is that captured outside of your department? Uh, th through Councillor Belanger, so the income from those units would more than cover the cost of the, the purchase of the unit as well as the extra internment services that are above that as well. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, moving on. Thank you, Worship. So I will now pass the floor to Rachel for the bylaw component. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Rachel, I did interrupt. Uh, sorry, I, I do have one question with respect to the Moby mats. Um, so this is to put wings, if you will, that go out each side at the end by the water? Correct. So currently the mats are a straight um, shot from the beginning to right to the waterfront. And sometimes what we've witnessed or some of the feedback from the public has been that, you know, when they're trying to maybe get down while somebody's already down there, rather than come all the way back to let someone else on, we can add these winged features. They kind of come out on a, an angle. Uh, that way, if someone does want to stay out there, they can kind of... Um, come off to the side on one of the wings and then it still leaves the actual access right to the water open. Okay, and, and how many access, uh, Moby accesses do we have now? Still just two? So during COVID, we were able to break up those mats and provide them across a number of the beachfront, almost all of them. Um, typically, they're supposed to be kept together in a 50-foot um, piece at beaches two and five, area two and five. The provincial parks did provide an accessibility review last summer of all their beaches and did identify beaches that they would not like to see the mats out at right now until they can um, improve some accessible features of their own. But it typically, and will be this year, beach area two and five. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Rachel? Thank you. Um, so as you can see from my first slide here, notable highlights for the bylaw department operating budget includes a total revenue increase of $280,000 for 2023. Um, it's also important to note that staffing costs for 2023 is at $180,000, which is only 20% of our overall operating expenditures under parking. Um, uh, next is just up for parking revenue from the chart here. So Third Street meter revenue is predicted to increase by $11,000. Third Street lot revenue is predicted to increase by $68,000. Then we have First Street lot revenue to increase by $20,000. Play lot 
uh, yeah, sorry, Playland lot revenue um, increasing by $75,000, MPA lot increasing by $14,000, and parking ticket revenue uh, increasing by $20,000. Um, so a really good overall uh, turnout from uh, comparing 2022 to 2023. And um, furthermore, under the chart for bylaw revenue, we're predicting an increase of $30,000 for business licensing. So for our, uh, in regards to our parking capital projects for 2023, um, under equipment parking signs, there's $25,000 budgeted. Um, that's for new and existing parking signs that we want to um, either put in as uh, new ones or upgrade old ones that have not been redone in uh, quite a number of years. Um, further to that, there's 25,500 budgeted for parking machines upgrades. So uh, typically every year we do a bit of an assessment on all of our parking machines and look at ones that need to be upgraded. Not a full machine upgrade, but just if um, per se like a motherboard is outdated, we want to upgrade those and stay on top of it rather than uh, basically creating more issues in the future. And uh, lastly, for the parking capital project, um, we have 7,500 for computer and office equipment, and that is just um, for laptop replacements as per IT's um, budgeting plan. And next, we have bylaw capital projects. Um, so the first one here is uh, 55,000 for a light duty vehicle. I know there was some discussion um, previously, but we would be looking at an SUV um, whether hybrid or not hybrid, we'll get into that. But um, it, it's important to note that um, we have six full-time staff members um, and eight summer officers, and we only have three vehicles that are our own, um, not including the surplus vehicles. Um, right now we have one SUV that we utilize the most, um, but we also have a truck which is dedicated to our animal control duties. Um, so picking up sometimes large deceased animals and then um, impounding dogs, as well as another uh, truck that supervisors use as we assist with um, a, the events department as well as public works bringing barrel cones around and things like that for um, for example like the Santa Claus parade and other various activities throughout the summer um, next we have equipment for radios and phones um, so 8500 is uh, allocated to that which I'll expand on the next slide um, typically though for radios um, uh, we're looking at to uh, upgrade two or three of them, um, and it's about a five to 10 year lifespan that we get from them. Um, lastly, uh, all of these projects are funded from the parking reserve, um, so they will not take anything from the tax supported side of budget. Um, next, for proposed draft two outlooks, we have meals and accommodations, which is currently at $1,000, um, as this is not something that we continually needed to use throughout COVID-19. Um, we're hoping to increase this amount back up to 2000 as most courses are back into in-person sessions, which re just require um, hotel and meals associated with mandatory training that our officers need. Um, and then next, we have... Um, uh, phones, which is currently under the capital budget. Um, so basically with this, we have $2,000 for phones um, as a draft two budget change. This means that $2,000 from the total of the 8,500 that I mentioned in the slide above um, is basically going from the bylaw capital budget being moved over to an operating budget side of things and that it will be uh, $2,000 added to the tax support side of budget. And uh, under the capital budget, we also have um, equipment for parking covers. Um, so it wasn't approved in draft one, and we are hoping to have uh, 5,500 allotted to that. Um, typically, it could be put under um, parking machine upgrades, so certainly we can keep it under that section and uh, not even worry about it. Um, but uh, currently, our parking machines when they received upgrades, the current uh, covers that we use during the winter months just to make sure they stay nice and workable, um, just don't fit a lot of our machines. So we're just looking to, to get those in there. 
Um, so at this time, that concludes my portion of the presentation, and I will quickly turn it back to Jocelyn to conclude the budget presentation. Thank you, Rachel. Questions or comments for bylaw? Seeing, seeing none. <laughs> Must be an important question. Back to you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Your Worship. So, um, first of all, that, that concludes all of the department presentations, and so I'd like to thank the team for all of their great work and presentations and information they've provided to you. And at this point, um, I'd like to ask Carly, have we been able to distribute those? Yeah, yeah. The, so, um, are the the color highlighted ones? So we're going to distribute to council members now. You've got this in your budget binders, but I've highlighted in yellow the positions that can be discussed in open session, and then anything that's not highlighted in yellow, it does require to go into closed session to discuss. And I do have one item that I will need to cover under closed session, um, but. I believe a lot of this has been covered already in our discussions in the presentations, but wanted to leave one last opportunity should anyone need to speak to anything or have a question. I didn't know if you knew when was the appropriate time to be asking that question. Okay, so we'll give council just a minute or so to have a look through this and just to reiterate, so council, if you have a question, uh, only about any item that is highlighted in yellow, the rest are in camera. was just uh, finishing having a look at that this is uh, if you have questions there will be other opportunities outside of today to ask those questions so yeah you don't have to absorb all of this in action today but uh, this is just a preliminary uh, quick check uh, out of the gate. so council any anything missing here that uh, has a uh, question about uh, if not we'll move along uh, councillor so just just to confirm if it's highlighted we can talk about it in open session now uh, I do have a question about the um, new part-time junior library aid positions um, two positions eight to twelve hours a week and I, and I was wondering uh, if that's the most efficient way to fill those that those number of hours um, probably going to answer my own question by saying it, unless there's an overlap there wouldn't that job be more desirable to someone at 16 to 24 hours a week through you your worship to the CEO uh, thank you Pam through your worship this role uh, we used to have uh, junior library aides and uh, due to our Sunday Saturday hours we converted them into a more senior role because they did have to 
uh, manage the desk during certain periods. This new rule is bringing back what we believe would be nice student opportunities. Um, we have our, our more senior team scheduled to come in during the day to do the majority of the uh, decision making and then the junior positions coming in after school to put away books. So it's a, a somewhat simple job. We don't necessarily need greater qualifications and we wanted to have an opportunity to bring young people back into the library in order to potentially choose library careers and, and continue with us. So that was our thinking. Does that answer your question, Councillor? It does. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No, Councillor no. Belanger. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a, just a question. Uh, we talked about fire and the uh, fire prevention officer. Uh, but then down near the bottom under building, we have a uh, fire prevention officer, uh, I guess a seasonal position. Um, I ju I just, are they in two separate budgets or? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Boulanger. So the, I, I referenced earlier uh, the ability for us to divert some of our revenue to fund positions as long as we received a service back in terms of commissioning and plan examination of, of fire systems within buildings. So that's what you're seeing reflected there. So to be clear, uh, Danny, th so that is 20% basically that'll be going from building to the fire department for use of that fire prevention officer's uh, expertise, if you will. Uh, that is correct, Your Worship. All right, thank you. Other questions or comments? Jerry? If I may, Your Worship, um, as I go through this list, uh, a lot of these are legacy asks, so I know when I was uh, interim CAO previously uh, coming into the 2018 budget, uh, some of these uh, asks were on the table then, and I was prepared to actually support them at that time. So if it adds uh, council perspective, uh, some of these are, have been long awaited to arrive to uh, assist the community and service better. Thank you very much. That's good, uh, good information for this council to have. Any other questions or comments? All right, moving along. Uh, anything else, uh, Jocelyn? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, at this point, all that we have left then is I do require a closed session um, item to be brought forward, and that concludes the open session portion of the budget. All right, Councillor Belanger. So, uh, just clarification, you had talked earlier about the, the new uh, communications government relations, uh, uh, that that needed a motion. Were we doing that prior to closed session or? Madam Clerk. I think it can just be included as part of our, I just need that, I do need direction on it. So I'm not sure if it's a, I don't know the proper way to do it. Yeah, if, if I could jump in, uh, we are interested in posting that position immediately. So if, if we could get a resolution on that, that would be. Then yes, Your Worship, then we should um, formally deal with it at the table now. Yes. If Prepare a motion then for us. Well, we have a motion to go in camera. Uh, that motion includes identifiable individuals, staffing, or uh, HR matters, and so on. So does it fall within? Uh, this position uh, would not because it's, um, it's not tied to any individual or HR concerns. It's a, no, it's a vacant posi new position. So that can be something that can be dealt with right now uh, prior to that. Or if you want to, um, well, we're going to pass this part of your report motion. So yeah, we would add it on to that. So if you wish to then prepare a motion now, uh, you can read it out. We'll get a mover and a seconder and move forward. Councillor Belanger. Thank you. Well, while that's happening, if uh, I could have a question related uh, to this position. Uh, I have in public session on a number of occasions expressed concern about the lack of dialogue between the municipality of Wasag Beach and other levels of government related to potential uh, partnerships or funding opportunities for the beachfront and obviously the library and arena. So I, I see this individual is probably having uh, experience and, and a 
quite a bit of knowledge related to, if not pre, uh, already established relationships, and uh, that they would work uh, very closely with our uh, grant writer. Uh, would that be accurate? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that, that is correct. And, and I'm, I'm happy to report, I've, I've been frantically typing here, we're, we're already lining up meetings with our provincial counterparts. We've actually got one set up for next week to reestablish those connections. Um, I'm thrilled to report that they are thrilled to hear uh, from Wasaga Beach. Again, this individual will absolutely help with all of that, um, preparing briefing notes for AMO, Roma, all that kind of thing where you're lobbying ministers. So it, it is a lot of work that goes into all of that, but uh, absolutely necessary for, for moving us forward. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Worship. Um, and let me know if this reads okay for you too, Jocelyn, but uh, it would be that Committee of the Whole is budget um, committee approved the position of Director of Communications and Intergovernmental Affairs to be included as part of the final 2023 budget. Is that, uh, you comfortable with that, Madam Treasurer? Yes, Your Worship, that, that confirms that it's part of the budget and approved now. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, do we need, it? sorry? Oh, Mr. CAO. CAO. Microphone. There we go. Um, just a, a question for Denise and Laura and Jocelyn. Do we need direction to be able to proceed to post the position? Uh, if we are approving it now, uh, I mean, I would I would throw it in there in approval that the position, or sorry, that direction to post the position effective immediately. We can add that as, and further that the position be posted effective immediately. Okay, so just read it one more time, uh, please, Madam Clerk, so council is clear. So it would read that Committee of the Whole is Budget Committee approved the position of Director of Communications and Intergovernmental Affairs to be included as part of the final 2023 budget and further that the position be posted effective immediately. Good with that, Mr. Seale, Madam, Madam Treasurer. All right, uh, do I have questions or comments? Mover and a seconder. Moved by Deputy Mayor Seale, seconded by Councillor Belanger. In favor? That motion is carried unanimously. All right, moving on in, uh, in the agenda. Uh, next item, item number four, closed session, resulted to section 239B of the Municipal 2001 as amended. The next portion of the January 19th, 2023 Committee of the Whole Budget Committee meeting will move into closed session to discuss personnel matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal and local board employees. Madam Clerk. Sorry, Your Worship. Um, there is a, another motion as part of Jocelyn's presentation that would need to be passed to. Do we do that? Be, before we go in session? Yes, she had her budget presentation motion, correct? Yes, I think. I believe in the staff report there's a. So, so would you rather defer that that um, gets passed after closed session then as a whole and incorporates everything? Or would you? Like yes, if okay. that could go last. All right, that'd so be great. we'll do that. Thank then. you. Just procedurally, that we'll we'll pass that one after. Okay, so we're good as we are. All right, you've heard the motion. Can I have a mover and a seconder for closed session? Moved by Councillor DeLeo, second by Councillor Ego. All in favor? Motion is carried. All right, we'll uh, take two minutes and uh, go into closed session.
So a quick report from closed session, a rise and report. We've been in a closed session to, to discuss uh, a couple of confidential staffing matters. We've done that, and uh, here we are in open session. And we do have a motion that Committee of the Whole Budget Committee confirm direction provided in closed session to the Director of Finance and Treasury pertaining to the budget staffing matters. I'm going to have a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor, or sorry, Deputy Mayor Snell. All in favour? Motion is carried unanimously. Moving on to item number 5.2, the Director of Recreation, Events and Facilities, that Committee of the Whole Budget Committee confirm the direction provided that the Director of Recreation, Events and Facilities in closed session pertaining to budget staffing matters. Mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor DeLeo, seconded by Councillor uh, Ego. All in favour? Motion carries unanimously. And that uh, concludes our day, and this meeting is adjourned. We're going to uh, <laughs> All right, uh, sorry folks, but uh, the clerk has uh, reminded us that we have uh, missed something here. So although we adjourn, adjourn the meeting, we're going to readjourn the meeting. Uh, and Madam Clerk, I'm going to let you read the, uh, the motion so we can have council uh, uh, move and second and pass that motion. Thank you, Your Worship. And if you, sorry, Madam Clerk, if you could just explain so the public can be aware as to why we're here and, and what happened. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so at the adjournment a uh, few moments ago, um, we did note that we would be moving uh, the Director of Treasury and Finance's report down um, to, to be uh, tabled after closed sessions. So that's why we have uh, we were able to maintain the stream and come back and readjourn the meeting. So we readjourned it at 5 p.m. Um, to finish off that portion. And this is in regards to the 2023 budget discussion draft one. So now that all elements have been reviewed and considered, the motion that is tabled for council, or sorry, committee of the whole today is that committee of the whole as council, committee of the whole as council's budget committee recommend to council that it receive the treasurer's supplementary report on the first draft of the 2023 operating and capital budget for information, disc discussion, and directions to staff for draft two, and further that committee of the whole as council as budget committee recommend to council that it receive the department program draft one budget presentations for information and discussion. All right, questions or comments from council? Seeing none, a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Timms. All in favor? That motion is carried. And Madam Clerk, this meeting is now adjourned. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.